Good morning. Good morning. I think there might be a couple more coming in. Good morning. Welcome to the fifth annual Craft of Writing Conference put on by the Tulsa Night Riders. We're glad that you're here. I, I think we've got a good uh, good series of lectures for you to listen to today. Uh, thank you for coming. Uh, I'd like to, of course, uh, we'd like to thank Triumph Worship Center for having us, uh, particular, particularly Pastor Robert Griffin, no relation. And Trent, I never caught Trent's last name, right. who's, our, who's our sound electronics and visual guy here. Without us, we'd all, without him, we'd all be in the dark. Yeah. Uh, thank you. To, <laughs> and, and maybe better off for it. You have to look at me. Thank you for uh, all the shepherds who are shepherding the speakers today. And thank you very much to all the speakers. Look forward to hearing you all. Of course, no event like this can be put on without the work of a lot of people. Um, uh, besides the speakers and shepherds, who deserve a lot of credit. A lot of credit is also due to the board of the Tulsa Night Riders, and I'd like to recognize them and stand up if you would, please. Uh, Jim Laughter, our communications director. Down here, down front, put us all on Zoom. Hope they don't break any cameras. Uh, Cindy Rose is working the table out there. She, oh, there she is. Uh, our our newsletter editor. She, if you get the newsletter, you know she puts out a tremendous newsletter. Uh, Susan Bonarocco, our secretary, I'm sorry, our treasurer. She keeps us all honest. She keeps the books. So she's maybe the most important. On all. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, Carolyn Steele, our electronics expert. <laughs> who's, she's actually the hospitality director, and she does a great job, as you've noticed, when she came in greeting everybody, uh, sign up and all that. By the way, don't forget to sign up for the drawing at the end, at the end of the day. I'd also like to recognize Marion Grace, who volunteered. She's our former uh, treasurer who volunteered and is working today. I'm, I'm Rex Griffin. I'm the president. Uh, and I'm just a figurehead. I'm just, I'm just supposed to be here and look good and stand up. And at least I'm getting to stand up, Mark Ryan. Most of all, though, one person has shouldered the burden of all. Uh, with the rest of us are just like Santa's little helpers compared to the person who's really put in all the work in doing this. I'd like to have a big round of applause for Vice President Kathy Nelson. She's doing a lot of work. You wouldn't believe what all she's done. So she hasn't missed a beat. Well, it's my great pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker today. It's been said, reading a Mike Wallace book is like dancing to a romantic ballad. He offers his hand, gently guides you across the floor, swaying to the song of the American West. Michael is an historian and biographer of the American West. You may have heard of him as the distinctive voice of the sheriff in the Pixar animated film, Cars. He's published 19 books, including the award-winning Route 66, The Mother Road, the book credited with sparking the resurgence of interest in the highway. Michael's latest book is the critically, critically acclaimed bestseller, The Best Land Under Heaven, The Donner Party and the Age of Manifest Destiny, was published in June 2017. His work has appeared in hundreds of national and international magazines and newspapers, including Time, Life, People, Smithsonian, The New Yorker, 
and the New York Times. Michael has been nominated three times for the Pulitzer Prize and was awarded a, a, a nominee for the National Book Award in 2016. Um, the National Book Award. In 2016, he received an Emmy Award for his work in the documentary film Boomtown. Michael's been inducted into the Writers Hall of Fame of America, <laughs> the Missouri Writers Hall of Fame, the Oklahoma Professional Writers Hall of Fame, the Oklahoma Historians Hall of Fame, and the Tulsa Hall of Fame. The Tulsa Night Riders is honored to present Michael Wallace as our keynote speaker. Well, good morning, friends. Good morning. Well, that was kind of a weak. <laughs> try it again. Try it again. Let's try it again. Good morning, friends. Good morning. I uh, am not permanently crippled, but uh, as I was just telling Rex, uh, I've had a, a little problem of attendance on, on this hip, and uh, it's an elective operation, so I'm finding my time uh, until my great surgeon who's already operating on me a half dozen times can fix that one up. My primary doctor, uh, Dave Nirenberg, always reminds me that, he puts it this way, Michael, you live with the sins of your youth. Football, the Marine Corps, and motorcycles. And that's probably true. But but today I have a, a mission in mind, and that and that mission is this is to trigger your creative juices uh, before you meet an impressive lineup of presenters who will focus on specific areas of writing. I'm pleased to be here with all of you people who celebrate language, style, nuance, magic, the written word. All of us celebrate the many kinds and sorts of writing, fiction, nonfiction, poetry, biography, mystery, romance, crime, drama, screenplays, and much more. Writing for all people, young and old, feeble and strong, blue blood and redneck, writing crammed with ambition, adventure, whimsy, and wisdom, writing about unspeakable acts, writing filled with fantasy and myth, and writing that tells no lies, writing that transforms us and makes us better human beings, writing that causes us to weep, to laugh, to shudder with fear, to dream, to scream in ecstasy, writing that puts us to sleep and writing that makes us lose all notion of slumber, writing that never dies but lives forever and always, writing to taste and savor and treasure, writing that can intoxicate and arouse writing that exposes the soul of the past, writing that shapes the future, the written word. When the end draws near, there's no longer, there no longer remains any remembered images. Only words remain. With that single sentence from the immortal, the Argentine poet, essayist, and short story writer, Jorge Luis Borges, captured the desire of those of us who have chosen to become writers for the body of work we leave behind. Thoughts of literary legacy are as old as the written word. Such thoughts, no doubt, flitted through the mind of Miguel Cervantes, a Spanish writer who died in poverty and obscurity. 
just short days before his death and after he received extreme unction, Cervantes whispered with one foot already in the stirrup and with the agony death upon me. He died on April 23rd, 1616, as Shakespeare breathed his last in retirement at Stratford. Unlike the bard, Cervantes was buried in an unmarked convent grave. He left no will, but he bequeathed to the world a classic satirical novel, Don Quixote. Cervantes' words live, so do the words of Shakespeare, Milton, Byron, and Alcott, and Whitman, and Hugo, and Tolstoy, Pound, Cather, Steinberg, Capote, Angelou, McMurtry, and all the other men and women who take up pencil and pen or sit down at a typewriter or word processor and then open a vein. Those of us who day in and day out deal with the compulsion to put words on paper that miraculously become stories and bound books. But before stories were recorded on cave walls or written on papyrus, parchment, or paper, there was the spoken word passed down by storytellers. I learned to write by listening to the spoken word long, long ago, 76 years to be precise. And my earliest teachers were my mother and her mother, Sophie Bonnet. My grandmother was a remarkable woman. She and her widowed mother and a slew of brothers and sisters came to America when she was a little girl. Her mother met a widower on the ship and married him. He had a pack of children. Between them, they had 15 children. Some ended up going back to Germany, some headed west. One went to Australia and became a rancher. Around the turn of the century, my grandmother moved to New Orleans and kept house for her brother, John. He was a painter and had a French Quarter studio. It was an exciting place and time. To occupy her spare time, my grandmother got together with several other young women and they visited and they made fancy cravats, neckties. And one day they got a wild notion and they wrote their names and addresses on small slips of paper and stuff that paper into the ties they made. Well, a man that came by occasionally to pick up these ties and these beautiful wooden boxes would sell them around Arlings Parish, Jefferson Parish, then throughout Louisiana. But this particular batch of <coughs> ties ended up crossing the Sabine River to the west, separating Louisiana and the Lone Star State. A short time later, a cowboy, not long returned from the Spanish-American War, came into the town of Ballinger, Texas, the closest settlement to his father's outfit. His name was Burke Dorsey, and he not only cowboyed, spent much of his time racing bicycles. They said Bert could take up his sack of Bull Durham tobacco and, and papers, the old timers called those cowboy Bibles, and he could roll a cigarette with one hand on a horseback. He was pure Texan and pure Irish. Bert Darcy had come to town to get ready for a wedding with one of his cousins. He needed to get a, tech, a necktie for the wedding, so he rode in in Ballinger and went to the local mercantile. He picked out the gaudiest tie he could see in the case, and as he was handling it, 
A slip of paper fluttered to the ground. On that paper, Bert Darcy found a young lady's name and address on Magazine Street, the French Quarter. He was curious, and by and by he wrote her a letter, and she wrote him back, and a regular correspondence developed. And then finally, Bert popped on an eastbound train, and he went to New Orleans to visit his pen pal, and they hit it right off. Six months later, Bert brought Sophie Bonner to Texas, and they were married in Fort Worth. And from there, they moved north to St. Louis Avenue to Texas at, to, te to uh, St. Louis, Missouri to Texas Avenue. It's, it's a good story for me. It's a good family story. And it's the way I came to know my grandfather, Bert Darcy. He died in 1943, two years before I was born. He quietly passed away during one of his afternoon naps in St. Louis with his cap pulled over his eyes, his boots next to the couch, and his cowboy Bibles in Second Durham, and his hands. I had my grandmother to thank for that story and for the many tales of Texas, the excitement of the early 1900s, St. Louis, World War I, and so much more. She was a tremendous source of knowledge and information. She was a fine inspiration. So was her daughter and my mother, Ann Wallace. It was both of these women together that inspired me to think grand thoughts and consider setting my thoughts on something other than having being just like everyone else. Sophie Bonner did it by telling me those wonderful yarns about relatives and actual characters from history who dared to be different and march to the beat of their own drummers. I was born and reared in, in St. Louis, West Town of St. Louis. And so I have always, always looked westward. I, I bleed St. Louis Cardinal Red. I prefer two-lane roads to turnpikes. I consider root bar pie sacred. And I believe in ghosts and trust in angels. Now, that was true when I was a boy, listening to my grandmother's stories and watching my mother work very hard in her kitchen. Her uniform of the day was always an apron. And <laughs> these men would come to our door looking for some work to do. Uh, they, were, they were tramps, that's what we call them. That's probably a nicer way of saying bum, as we say today, homeless people. And I could see some of them still had on a remnant of a uniform from the war, a tattoo. And they came down to our place right off from 66, or right off 66, about as far as Stan Musial could get a heart off. And they'd appear at the back door and they'd doff their caps and say they were looking for some work in exchange for some food. And my mother, I guarantee you, always found work for them. She found work for everyone. And then she fed them. And they ate in the shade of the backyard. And I pulled over a chair and stood on by my mother's side at the sink. And we looked out the window and we watched these men as they ate. And we made up stories about them. We gave them names and decided where they had come from, where they were going. I knew to listen to these stories we made up. And this is how I first learned about storytelling. And when the men finished eating, they'd rinse off the dirty dishes and the 
a faucet and they take them to my mother and then they walk off out of our lives back up to the mother road. And every time, every time that happened, my mother would tell me, she'd say, son, you must remember this. Never, ever turn anyone away from your door. They may be an angel, an angel in disguise. And her words stay with me to this day. In, in this land right here, way down yonder in the Indian nation, I have found many angels in disguise and plenty of ghosts as well, just as I found them ever, elsewhere in my homeland of Missouri and in my beloved New Mexico. It was in New Mexico, in Santa Fe and Taos, where I paid my dues. That's where I sought out and found my mentors, Thornton Wilder, Jack Potter, Paul Horgan, Wallace Stegner, and Frank Waters. Together, my wife Suzanne and our own band of merry pranksters, dubbed the spinners, sat at the feet of Dorothy Brett, the deaf English painter who left Queen Victoria's court to, to become a painter herself. This woman who came to New Mexico in the early 1920s with D.H. and Frida Lawrence. And that first day we found her, we sat at her feet. And I asked Brett, how could we start a renaissance? And she told us, it was a conversation that lasted a long time, many years. And over the course of this time, the Honorable Brett and several of the other survivors of Mabel Dodge Blue House in her circle, her great salon, continued to teach us so much more and share stories and secrets. My true love, Suzanne, helped me launch yet another literary magazine. And we read poetry and staged original dr dramas and absorbed story after story from the endless resource of humankind we found in those high desert and mountain hamlets and from the other shoulders of our beloved Mother Road. And I learned the hard, lonely craft of writing. There were, as always, many adventures, sometimes too many. In 1970, when I was up against the wall and needed rent money, and new shoes to replace the old Marinish combat boots that had about played out. I managed to land a magazine assignment and that promised a bit of badly needed income. The story was out amongst the Hopi people in the Black Mesa region of Arizona, where Peabody Coal was raping land in some of the tribal people's holy sites. So I took a deep breath, walked into a store, picked up a pair of sensible canvas shoes, took them under my arm, and dashed like a delinquent fullback for the door, vowing to myself to return and make things right after I finished the job and received my wages. I had to rendezvous with a photographer named Terrence Moore in Bullhead City, Arizona, on the Colorado River. And I took to the open road on Route 66 at Albuquerque with my thumb in the air. A line of trucks rumbled toward me. They, there were six of them in all, and they ground their gears and as they crept up Nine Mile Hill toward me. And, and they passed right by me, slowly, but passed right by me. But every person on those trucks cut their eyes over and looked at me, but they kept going until they were about a half mile up the road. And then they made slow U-turns and came back, each of those trucks. Then they turned again and, and came back up to me and the head truck stopped, came to a halt right beside me. Well, I came to find out these were French Canadians, every one of the crews. And these trucks were loaded down with slaves, big ones like Santa Claus's slave. And the Canadians were headed to Los Angeles to sell these slaves 
to interior decorators so they can be positioned in luxurious homes and fancy people who could take their evening cocktails inside the sleigh and look out at the twinkling lights in the city. Now, most of these men spoke very little English. They didn't speak any Spanish. One of the band though, spoke better English than the rest of them, even though it was limited. But he made his case to me. He said they were all tired after this long trip coming out of Canada. And they wondered if I'd like to ride with them, help serve as re driving relief along the way. And is there an interpreter at gas stations and cafes? And I agreed. So I got in that first truck and the trucks geared up and we continued on headed due west. We drove all afternoon into the evening. We crossed the deserts and the dry streams of Western New Mexico, passing Billy's with Sky City of Acoma and across the Laguna lands. At Gallup, we pulled inside a lot of burger for dinner. And I handled all the negotiations and we were soon back on the road with sacks of food. But a few miles down the road, we all unwrapped our green chili burgers only to find that something was missing. There was no beef inside, only garnished buns. I ordered the trucks to halt right there. And like a Marine platoon sergeant, I said, we're going back, boys, and we turned around. And this column of, of, uh, of troops, it looked like a John Ford film. We returned to Gallup, and I walked up to the window with this platoon of angry Frenchmen behind me. And without saying a word, there were profuse apologies and fresh hamburgers, this time with beef. And we were soon... <laughs> We were soon on our way again, bid them farewell and return to the journey. And all night long, we drove. I moved from truck to truck. Sometimes I took the wheel. Mostly, I explained the country we were moving through and told my new pals the best stories I could think of. I spoke of dust bowl pilgrims and bandits and pointed out familiar landmarks silhouetted in the soft evening shadows. The painted desert and the petrified forest came and went. We careened through Holbrook and Winslow and paused two guns to watch the moon rise. Coyotes, God's own song dogs, danced in the road before us beneath the moonlight and the truck beacons. The Frenchmen sang their favorite tunes and I serenaded them with the best of Woody Guthrie, Bob Wills, and a little bit of Dylan. And I remembered some of the ditties my grandmother had taught me, and I gave them to my new friends. In a prison cell, I wait thinking of you, mother dear, and the happy home that I have left behind. Tramp, 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 the boys come marching. And then, pony boy, pony boy, won't you be my pony boy? The next morning, we got to where I was going. I said so long to my Canadians. They pulled up in Kingman, a stalwart Route 66 bird, and I jumped out of the lead truck. I shook hands up and down the line and watched the procession of trucks creaking under the weight of all those slaves as they pressed on toward the Black Mountains on the border, the bones of the land that Steinbeck called it, and the shining land called California waiting on the other side. I watched them until they were specks on the horizon. Then I pressed on. A friendly deputy sheriff took me down the winding road to Bullhead City. I hooked up with my photographer in his black and white station wagon called the Skunk and we made our tour together. We visited smoke belching power plants, ancient Hopi villages, and climbed steep mesas where prairie eagles were tethered. We collected information, photographs, and stories, and after we made our rounds, 
we returned lickety split to Santa Fe. And I put everything together. I wrote my piece, submitted it, and was thankfully promptly paid. But before I went to La Fonda for a celebration of tequila, before I headed to Coney's Market to restock my pantry, even before I brought the landlord some rent money, I made a beeline to that shoe store, walked in and paid for those canvas shoes that served me so well. I put the cash in that man's hand, bewildered, and walked away. The memories of all those high times are with me. I recall that it was just about that time that I declared my major, if you will, as a writer. I staked my claim to the American West, not just cowboys and Indians, but the contemporary West and all the issues and conflicts, the controversies, and the many topics of cultural and social history that abound there. Throughout my career as a professional writer, as a journalist, no matter if I was writing for an alternative newspaper or the New York Times, I tried to focus on subjects that were maligned or misunderstood. I wanted to set the record straight. I am a true Libra child, always looking for balance and hopefully a bit of justice. And this was true throughout the years I spent as a reporter in Texas and the Southwest. During the 21 month tour of duty with Time Inc. in the Caribbean Bureau. And then later, when I came full circle, took up a roost in old Indian territory. Concentrating on the line to subjects dominated not only my journalistic endeavors, but also continued when it came to my books. This is true no matter if I'm writing about tequila, the most misunderstood beverage in the Americas, or if my subject is the oil baron who looked more like a Methodist preacher, an outlaw whose episodes of social banditry tells an entire generation's story, a quietly strong and eloquent Native American leader, or the old highway that folks thought was gone, but alas, we found all varicose and scarred, but still going strong out amongst the weeds. I carry those memories with me. I always have them forever. Images of sipping iced tea, spiked with stalks of mint with a gracious Lady Bird Johnson at the LBJ Ranch, and listening to Barbara Jordan, knowing that if God is a woman, she sounds like Miss Jordan. Memories of flying with the remarkable Sam Walton, just the two of us in a small plane, high in the heavens over Missouri, debating whether or not his Walmarts were good for my mother Road. Memories of sitting with Cherokee Chief Wilmer Landkiller on her front porch, just a short ways from the spring where her ancestors drew sweet water. Memories of stalking the dimensions of the old 101 Ranch with gnarled cowboys who rode with Tom Hicks and Bill Pickett and looked into the eyes of Buffalo Bill and Geronimo in chains. Memories of a 90-year-old retired bank robber who went on to scout pretty boy Floyd and who gave me an audience in his Airstream trailer tucked away in a bootlegger's hollow where more than one man and any number of soiled doves and violent deaths. Memories of spending time with Lillian Redmond, the Harvey girl who came to New Mexico in a covered wagon, and then, like a down home Lorelei, managed to switch on the neon lights at her blue swallow motel in Tucumcari each and every night, luring travelers off the boring in this interstate, bringing them back to the America that used to be. Now, I, I was not born in these Oklahoma hills, but it's here where I belong. I like Missouri and New Mexico. It is here 
I have a sense of place, just as I do in those other states. I came here to this land many years past as a fully grown man with my wife, Suzanne. We made the conscious decision to adopt this land and make it our home. And you can see or say that I truly discovered this crossroads uh, in the sweltering summer of 1980 while I was working out of the Caribbean Bureau for Time Magazine in Miami. I had occasion to spend some time in Tulsa. I was hunting a good story and was nested at the Mayo Hotel. Not long before it closed, I had plenty of ice and the AC set so low I could see my breath. And one late afternoon, I moseyed down to the Arkansas River to have a look. Long before there was a Tulsa, there was the river, the longest tributary of Mississippi, Missouri system, near its headwaters in the Colorado Rockies. Tennessee Pass on the eastern slope of the Continental Divide, glacier lakes and snow melt fed the river before it flowed 1,400 plus miles southeast through Colorado, Kansas, Oklahoma, and Arkansas on its way to the Mississippi. I knew it was given to rampaging tantrums. The river was historically as moody as a water moccasin and just as cruel. A temperamental river prone to devastating floods, the Arkansas dared to be tanked. Then, of course, finally that happened. But for many years, the river did as it pleased, and Tulsans gave the muddy waters their respect. For the Arkansas River is rich in history. Indians bathed their ponies in the river. Adventurers camped on the sandbars, and cowboys paraded cattle through the shallows. Zebulon Pike explored the Arkansas. And in, the 1832, in an 1832, the noted author Washington Irving chronicled the river's sand shore bordered by cottonwoods and willows as he made his famous tour of the prairies. Irving and his entourage rode the banks of the Arkansas and so saw beaches and muddy banks marked, marked by the hooves of Osage and Pawn, Pawnee hunting parties. They paused to quench their thirst at the foot of the steep lawn of what we now know as the McBurney Mansion, built 95 years after Irving's journey by an Irish immigrant who struck it rich in black gold. Today, cool water still pulses from that underground spring that surfaces there. Irving saw the sun shining through the leaves tinted by autumn and was reminded of the stained glass and, and uh, clustering columns of Gothic cathedrals. The, re the river scenery in this place was beautifully diversified presenting long, shiny reaches, Irving wrote in his journal. It was a bright, sunny morning with a transparent atmosphere seemed to bathe the very heart with gladness. Generally known for his humorous condition of, of uh, romanticized tales, such as Rip Van Winkle and the Legend of Sleepy Hollow, Irving's prose turned out to be much more than sentimental travel writing, but rather a depiction of a landscape that transcends the romantic frontier metaphor and sheds light on the environment's impact on Irving himself. While others viewed this land and its creatures as endless, something to be conquered and used, Irving became woefully aware of its infinite nature, something that some people today, particularly most of our Oklahoma politicians, still fail to comprehend. 
But on that hot afternoon in 1980, when I made my own trek to hopefully catch a marshal of what Irving witnessed, I was more concerned with reaching the cool shade provided by the cottonwoods standing along the riverbanks. And it was there that I encountered a fellow who put me in mind of those silent men with empty eyes who occasionally appeared at our back home, my boyhood home in Missouri, those angels in disguise. This fellow sitting beneath an oral cottonwood on the edge of the river had the same empty eyes. We nodded at each other. And as we watched the sun towering in the sky, he spoke to me. He told me he was pleased it was twilight and he was another day closer to dying. A long time ago, he heard a person could wear out their heart by sleeping on their left side. He said he had slept in that position ever since. He told me straight out that it had been years since he liked himself, almost a lifetime ago when he was young and strong and gave a damn. He told me of his Cherokee lineage and of his growing up years in the Cherokee nation. He said that he had been an Oklahoma cowboy, he could ride, rope, and holler like a banshee. He, he could also rodeo and he made the circuits uh, mostly performing at the big Mother Road venues, Oklahoma City, Amarillo, Albuquerque, Flagstaff, Barstow, and the others. And then his life came all apart. A crippling fall from a bucking Bronco at a two-bit rodeo had left him with a broken back, permanent limp, and a bad attitude. For good measure, a steady diet, 90 proof whiskey stopped him from ever climbing back into his saddle again. The man allowed that he had lost everything. He had no more family, no more friends, and no more high speed gallops on speedy spirited cow ponies. He had the, he had no self respect. It had been years since he looked in a mirror. He said he had become a street person, just a nice way of saying bum. And I walked a ways with this man, and we headed up the trail toward the old alignment of Route 66, making its way across the chocolate colored river. We, we passed the spring at the McBurney Mansion, and then we reached the old bridge. And I recall the many times I had sped across these waters on my way west, chasing the sun and the moon, my dreams. And we went down below the bridge, and the man showed me his makeshift camp of cardboard boxes and goodwill blankets. And like the man, the bridge had been abandoned. But at one time, it had been the best way to go. It was no longer used for vehicular traffic, but sat neglected and forlorn next to a newer bridge. Back on the trail again, we stopped and watched the river flowing past. Neither of us spoke for a long time. I let my thoughts take me back to the years before any bridges spanned the Arkansas. I considered the Creek people who came this way to build a new home and start their lives over. I thought about cattlemen herding hundreds of Texas longhorns across the rocky ford, the shallows of the river. I imagined the ferry boats loaded with passengers and the, and the first railroad bridge erected back in the late 1800s. Uh, yeah. Then I recall reading about the crude toll bridge that had been built in 1903. Workers and machines crossed it to get to the rich oil fields waiting on the other side and helping to assure Tulsa's future. 
And, and then my mind brought me back to Sai, the father of 66, and the man who made sure that the new highway came through Tulsa, his adopted hometown, and how he made the 11th Street Bridge the route to take. We walked on and went back to the same place we had first met. We turned around and looked up into the neighborhoods and beyond. I spied the Art Deco towers down in the skyline. And the old rodeo rider clutched a paper sack holding his few worldly possessions, a broken pocket comb, some raggedy underwear, socks, a sack of tobacco and rolling papers in a tarnished belt buckle the size of a pie plate that she had won long before at a rodeo. There was also a good sized tomato wrapped in newspaper in the sack. And he admitted to me that he had liberated that tomato from a backyard garden the night before. And as we walked and swapped more stories, mostly about traveling the road, a morsel of survivor cried out from the man. He ignored the pleas of some passing pals to share their jug, jug of vintage rock gut. Instead, he picked up his pace and he told me he would go to a local mission that evening for a hot supper and a shower in a night resting under cool sheets. He said all he had to do was endure a few hymns and listen to a fire brimstone sermon delivered by a reformed drunk. It was then, it was time for me to head back to the mail. We stopped in the shade and the man from the river, that bridge man, shook my hand and bade me farewell. But before he walked away, he stopped and turned. He reached in a sack and he gave me his prized tomato and he told me to enjoy it. He thanked me for spending time with him, helping him remember. Finally, he said maybe he would sleep on his back for a while and give his tired heart a rest. And when he left, I bit into that tomato. It was vine wrapped and warm and juicy, it tasted of summer. And the juice ran down my chin and droplets splattered on the hot sidewalk. And when I looked up, the man was gone, making his way in a city that didn't know he existed. Two years later, I married Suzanne and we moved to Tulsa. That trip to Oklahoma, find the story, had made an impression on me. I had fallen deeply in love with the state and the people. I felt I had a true sense of place. Not long after we, we moved here, I went down to the and looked at a cowboy. I roamed the shoreline and went down under the old bridge. His camp was gone. And there were some young guys there cooking fried fish, and they didn't know about any old cowboys. Didn't know what to tell me. But the memory of that bridge man that I met long ago stays with me. I find it slightly ironic that in this mineral rich land that had produced so many oil millionaires. One of my dominant early recollections is of a salt of the earth soul who was in my life for such a fleeting time and whose name I never knew. A Cherokee cowboy for a little <coughs> while lived beneath the mother road. Never could find him, not a trace. I still look sometimes when I, <laughs> sometimes when I, head from home and go down to the river. Uh, maybe he was an angel in disguise. I want to close with a story that I've told 
several times, but I think it bears retelling because it it sparks uh, and speaks to the importance of having a sense of place for all of us. And again, I go back to that sense of place. It cannot be ignored or avoided. And I really learned that on an October morning filled with sunshine and promise. Some years past, Suzanne and I drove to Sequoia County in eastern Oklahoma to attend a literary landmark ceremony honoring Sequoia, the Cherokee scholar who created a syllabary for his people and for whom the county was named. The ceremony was to be held 10 miles south, northeast of Salisaw at the one room cabin built by hand human logs by Sequoia in 1829. And in route, Suzanne at the wheel, we talked about some of our previous trips to the historic cabin and to the many other sites in the area. I visited so many times while working on my biography of Charles Arthur Pretty Boy Floyd. Floyd was the consummate Oklahoma bandit, still remembered, often revered by the hardworking country folks who passed down stories about Pretty Boy like heirloom China. Just a short ways down the turnpike, a lone monarch butterfly flew into the windshield with a splat and became tangled in the windshield wiper blades. We were saddened to see this exquisite creature end its life in such a way. We knew that this was the precise time when the last generation of monarchs of summer make their incredible journey of thousands of miles south as far north as Canada to their wintering grounds. And this was the time they fly over the landscape when they dance across old Indian Tory just as they have forever. The monarchs come to rest at Pismo Beach and Big Sur in California, and others go even farther and congregate by millions deep in the mountains of Mexico, where they cloak fir trees and cluster on boughs, where they rest all winter. And when they flex and flash their orange and black wings to soak up the sun, the firs appear to be trimmed with jewels. In the spring, when it is time to move northward, again, the butterflies cascade from the trees in a cloud bomb, waterfalls of sable and saffron. Our, our conversation turned back to the uh, news of the day and the upcoming ceremony. And we also talked about the memories of coming this way years past with friends now gone and of other times that each of us, but each of us at the same time could not help but see that monarch, that the third butterfly whose journey had ended so unceremoniously on the car windshield. And I knew Suzanne was especially touched since she was at the wheel, which meant she felt she was in some way culpable for the butterfly's dem demise. At Salisaw, we made a pit stop at a convenience store. While I fetched water, Suzanne got out of the car and carefully lifted the wiper blade and placed the crumpled monarch in her palm. I took over as driver and Suzanne said she wanted to make a stop before we reached the event site. And I knew in a heartbeat where she wanted to go. Without a word being spoken, I turned off the highway and into the Aikens Cemetery. This quiet country graveyard was where the largest funeral in 
state history that took place on another October morning back in 1934 when the slain pretty boy came home and was laid to rest with other family members. We had walked the graveyard many times and it seemed so familiar as we walked again through the formations of the dead marked by stones. We went directly to the Floyd plot where pretty boy lies next to his baby brother, E.W. Floyd, remembered as one of the best sheriffs ever in Oakland. And as we stood there, Suzanne gently placed the monarch on pretty boy's granite tombstone. It was if she were leaving me, outlaw will be 30 years old forever a flower or a remembrance. And I still can never explain what happened next. In only seconds that monarch lifted its wings. The wings seemed whole and caught the sunshine. And then suddenly the butterfly rose from the stone and hovered right between us and then it fluttered off, flying south. Neither of us could speak. We just stood there with our mouths open, tears welling in our eyes. We watched the monarch till it was out of sight. Then we went on a few short miles to the cabin. The Cherokee tribal leaders, dignitaries, and citizens gathered to honor Sequoia, a wise man who himself went south to Mexico but never returned. His bones were said to remain there in the warm sand. When I rose to speak during the ceremony, I put aside my notes and I told the story of the monarch. And I was compelled to share it. When uh, I thanked, when I looked out and I finished talking, saw the many Cherokee people there, many of them were nodding and, and some smiled. And it, it seemed to me that they were not surprised at all by my simple story of, of resurrection. And later, when I took the time to consider that day, I understood the reaction. A Cherokee elder once told me that a butterfly brings special blessings when it passes over you. And in some American Indian tribes, butterflies are thought to be the departed souls of ancestors. The emergence of the adult butterfly from a cocoon symbolizes the freedom of the soul. The butterfly metamorphosis is the greatest, greatest transformation in the animal world and stands as a symbol of new life, of change. Like monarchs, the people of this land have no long and arduous journeys. Like the fragile butterflies, Oklahomans have endured much, never given up, and they have left on their own pilgrimages and traveled far. Some do not return but others come home, they keep their sense of place. My studio in Tulsa are my best icons and treasures. A piece of wood was once part of Woody Guthrie's home. D.H. Lawrence's double-headed axe, buffalo skulls from Willow Rock, pretty boy Floyd's death mask, my grandfather's soldier medals instead of fancy wooden necktie box. Branding irons from the 101 Ranch, tarnished deputy sheriff badges, a lucky coyote fang from no man's land, a Philip 66 sign riddled with bullet holes, a mother road shield, there's a jug of genuine Creek County stump liquor, a hangman's noose from Fort Smith, battered typewriters, Baseballs bearing the signatures of my boyhood heroes, stacks of books, mounds of letters, diaries, photos, and memories, memories. 
the lower from my windows, I see that Arkansas flowing past and I dare to dream. I spy the old bridge that links east and west. Sometimes from the quarter of my off, I catch a glimpse of an angel in disguise. And then I look beyond the great oaks and magnolias, beyond the river and the bridge to the eternal and everlasting west. It is then that I know the truth of this place. I feel it in my heart and in my bones. I am home. Thank you. Thank you. If there's time, I would entertain some questions. If anybody wants to know anything, game to talk about anything. What's uh, your favorite, favorite book that you've written? Pretty Boy. The Pretty Boy Ends, the fictional grapes of Wrath Begins. It's, it's just a, a story using this young bandit as a vehicle to tell the story of his time. So that book means a lot to me, but, you know, like a lot of other writers say, they ask me my favorite books, and they're all my children, so it's hard to pick your favorite child. And uh, I do have a few delinquent sons in the bunch, but I do like, do like bad books. Yes. What's your favorite book you've read? Well, I've been interviewed many times by that. I had to name my 10 favorite books and so forth. Um, it, it goes back and forth, but it's probably To Kill a Mockingbird. It, it's one of the best. <clears throat> but uh, there, there are other books that I love so much. I love that. There's a, a little known novel that's very good called The Confederacy of Deaths. It's a man that book. It's a great book. Uh, of course, Huckleberry Finn, In Cold Blood, Lolita. Unbelievably good book. So, but for today, I'll say Harper Lee. Can you tell us more about the Mockingbird? Why is To Kill a Mockingbird your favorite oh, book? Yeah. <clears throat> well, I, you know, I write about books, <clears throat> and there are some universal, some universal truths, uh, and, and, and there are lessons to be learned. That, and certainly, in many books, especially To Kill a Mockingbird, and those same lessons uh, apply to can be learned here by Oklahomans, by Missourians, by Californians, uh, everyone, everyone really, there's a lot of universal truths in that, in that book and the, uh, the bravery, the wisdom of the fictional Atticus Finch and the story of those children and their trust and curiosity and imagination. And, and Lee just did a tremendous job of putting that whole thing together. Yes. Well, you're writing a, a magazine article, for instance, the kind of long form stuff you read. But how long did you, when do you decide on something, magazine piece, that when do you decide, you know, this is a book, I can go When do you have enough information or? That, that happened to me. Uh, Actually, after uh, I moved here in, 19, uh, in the early 80s, it, it hit me. I, I was tired of, uh, I had written for newspapers and magazines, both as a correspondent and freelance uh, for many years, since the 60s. I, uh, I was ready to, to write bigger, to, to take up the long form. And, um, 
And, and that's when I, I did, and I wrote my first book, Oil Man, came out in 1988. And that was followed by Route 66 and so forth. So on. up to now, you know, my 20th book. But um, uh, and now I'm wrestling with this. And I'm not really wrestling, but I'm pretty much agreed to it in my own mind that um, uh, after this book is published, I'm probably not going to write um, uh, any more uh, about uh, Western history and culture or biography. I'm going to do a little autobiographical. I'd write a pure autobiography to draw upon many of my own experiences. And I, I like the idea of that. Freedom. I wrote some fiction early, early on in my life and poetry, and I'm, I'm just going to, to put it on cruise control and do that again. Yes? So you talked about pretty much, I was just wondering, do you think that the fascination of us, especially in the US, is that an extension of? Oh, yeah, for sure. Uh, Oscar Wilde, of all people on his speaking tour of the West in Denver, made this statement. Americans have always loved their heroes, and they tend to take them from the outlaw class. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. There's so much. <laughs> this book I'm writing now, uh, Bell Star. Whatever you think you know about Bell Star, please forget because finally there's, this will be a national book that will put to rest so much of the horrible uh, writing about this woman. I tend to write about subjects that are maligned, as I said, or caught up in, you know, Billy the Kid, David Crockett, Pretty Boy, the Donner Party, all wrapped up in myth innuendo and outright lies and then peel it back because the true story is the better story. But I guarantee to you, nobody is as twisted up in fable and lie uh, as much as, as this, this lady <laughs> that was story. So it, it's, uh, it's been, like all books, it's been a difficult story to tell. Anybody that tells you Writing a book like that is easy. It's either crazy or a fool. But it's, uh, I'm delighted that I've captured her. And uh, that dance is about to end in a month. Yes? Is the story of the today part of our life? Oh, some of it. Yeah, some of it, of course. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. When, when I think I, in writing an article, how do I discern between truth? Oh, yeah. Oh, uh, that's easy for me. It doesn't go into my writing if this is a nonfiction book unless I know it's true. It has to be true. There's no guesswork. There has to be provenance. You have to prove it out. There's no guessing. There's no making up a dialogue. So unless you have the letters, unless you have the correspondence, unless you have the testimony of these people. And, and, and too many people are lazy and they just make things up. And then what happens is they repeat the sins of the past. They go back to those first books and then they regurgitate it and so forth. There's not, nothing really original about it. Uh, writing nonfiction requires an incredible amount of research, total research, and it, it just has to be proven up. Yes. Was there a moment when you were researching Bell Star where you like, I've heard all of this, I've heard these stories, I've heard these stories, and then you went, found something where you went, it's all lies, and 
I have to do this. I have to go ahead and give credible work yeah. on this person. That's, that's what I did. When I write about someone, uh, or, or some event or whatever, when I write, uh, I have to go there. I go to every place I know this entity was, where they walked, where they lived. And in the case of Paul Storr, that's a story that starts in the South and then moves to Missouri, where she was born, and then includes time in no certain order in Texas, Missouri, Arkansas, Kansas, California. That whole, she had a whole California experience. And I have to go to those places, even if they're different. Obviously, where she and her first husband, Jim Reed, lived in, in, in Los Angeles, Los Angeles far different than, than it was then. And there's not, I can't, you're not gonna find a physical trace of it, but I need to go to those places. Research now is obviously made so much easier uh, because of, of the internet. I can now go into archives, um, Yale University, the National Archives, um, you know, uh, without, having to go there or to pay someone to do it for me. And with slight fees, I can enter archive. But I still do much field work. Some of my best discoveries have been made in someone's attic, in a trunk, or in a little old local historical society in their microfilm. So you have to do that, and you have to be very careful about who to believe and who not to believe. All right. It's been my pleasure to be with you all. <laughs> Folks, I hate to interrupt. I can sit here and listen to Mr. Wallace all day. But we've got other speakers. Uh, I suggest you should uh, adjust your schedule by about 15 minutes, at least the morning schedule. We've got a speaker here. We've The other classrooms are down this hall to the left, to my left, in, in rooms A and B. Uh, I remind you again, the ladies' restroom is on to my left, men's is to my right, and we'll go ahead and do the other. Oh, I'm sorry, uh, Carolyn used to do a presentation. Uh, Mr. Wallace, we felt so honored to have you as our keynote. Yeah. And we have a small hope to thank you from the top of my brothers. And we want to give you our latest technology, yeah. with a lot of the authors are probably from the audience. Oh, great. Okay. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate that. Well, we appreciate you. You know, no matter what you're. No matter what genre you follow, uh, there's a, there are universal truths that apply to it all, whether you're writing fiction, nonfiction, and so forth. But the most important advice and the simplest I can give you is keep writing. <laughs> yeah. Well, first of all, Stephen Strange was a little hard to like, but eventually you do come to like him. Um, what I find appealing is they all kind of have some magic to them and a sense of wonder and a sense of discovery in these stories. So I think that's one of the reasons that I like them and I think that's what makes them interesting to me and hopefully to you too. So every character needs an interesting setting. And that's one of the first places you start is where is your book going to be set? And then you're going to put your characters in that world, and you're going to build your characters to adapt to that world. Characters are a product of their environment. So you want to have an interesting setting with plenty of conflict, and then how they react to that conflict is going to make a difference. So Claire is an army nurse in World War II. They've just come back from the war. Her husband was a spy for the British government. 
And they're on their first real, I guess their second honeymoon back together. And he goes off looking at his genealogy, which I'm a genealogist, so this is why I'm probably interested in this. Uh, and then he's looking for his villainous great, 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 whatever grandfather, who was Black Jack Randall. He was an English dragoon who terrorized the Highlands. And then you get looking at um, Claire, and she's a nurse. And she's interested in plants for medicinal purposes. And she goes into a circle of stones looking at the plants, touches the stone and disappears and falls through time and ends up in 1745, right in the middle of the Jacobite Revolution. So that has always been something to me that I liked because I'm a history buff. I thought that was really interesting. But she's mistaken for an English spy. The Scots think she's a spy and nobody knows who to trust or how to trust her. So she has to find her way through that world. Stephen Strange, again, arrogant, brash, headstrong, very talented. Um, because he is involved in a crash that leaves him unable to operate and be a great surgeon, he has to find a new meaning for his life. And he goes through a true evolution in his mental health. And he realizes that he can be more than just a doctor. And he finds this mythical teacher who guides him into this magic realm. And he goes and reads every book they have in the whole library, which is voluminous, which is why I like him, because he reads. And he learns these mystical talents that can help save the world. So that's one of the reasons why I like him. And again, that personal ethos is tested. Now, when we get into Harry Potter, again, magic user, doesn't know he's a wizard, discovers this as he becomes a young man, and he gets sent off to magic school, to Hogwarts. And of course, you need a mentor. So we have Dumbledore and some of the other professors who guide him. And then we have his sidekicks, which are Hermione and Ron. And they complete Harry. They're there to help him become a whole person. They're there to do things that he can't do because he is the mythical boy who lived. And so he's got to find his way to solve some mysteries and save his world. Now, one of the things that you can do as an author is you can rely on the unreliable narrator, a spin doctor who's going to tell your story from a whole other angle. And it may not really be the truth. If you think about um, some of the politicians that we have in the world and some of the news articles that we have and some of the news media that we have, we have a lot of spin doctors we can draw from. If you think about the song Short People by Randy Newman, they got no reason to live. But that's from his perspective. It may not be the truth, but that's one perspective. And, and so that's that's an example of an unreliable narrator. Um, objectivity is subject to your story. So there's lots of different ways that you can take that unreliable narrator and have to tell the story. And everybody else in the book will be sitting there going, that's not what happened. It's not how I remember it. So you can take that and really play with that. I haven't done that yet. I'm actually working on a book now where I'm going to do that. So um, there's a lot of things in my books that she believes to be true that really aren't. But that's what she's come to think over the years, and she's got to find the truth in some of her own family history. So that's another thing that you can do is that unreliable narrator. You want your characters to be interesting. You want them to feel like they're real people with real interesting quirks. Uh, they need to be fully developed. They need to have a story to tell. What's Lauren's story? Her story is, I'm here to find the truth. But what if it's a truth I can never tell? Yeah, I found Bigfoot. But if I tell, the species could be in danger. So it becomes a truth she can never tell. Um, they need to have an interesting way of seeing the world. She sees it as a scientist, and she believes in the scientific method, and she believes in what she can prove. And until she can prove something, she's not inclined to believe that it's real. They have to have their own voice and their own ways of expressing themselves. And each of your characters have to have their own voice. And sometimes that can be a real challenge. I like to do it by making my characters very ethnically diverse and from different countries. Of course, they travel all over the world, so that's not hard for me to do. But my four main characters, she's Cherokee, he's Anglo-Saxon, the cameraman is French-Canadian, and the uh, research assistant is from South Africa. So I use accents as a way of, or a way of speaking 
that's based on their heritage and their history. Idiosyncrasies make characters fun. One of the things I love to do in my books is I find which character of mine is an Android user and somebody hands him an Apple phone. Now watch the hilarity ensue. <laughs> try it sometime. If you're an Android user, pick up an Apple phone and try to figure out what to do with it. <laughs> I'm not technologically challenged, but sometimes there are things that I have limitations on. <laughs> so that's always something that's fun that you can do. There's all different kinds of ways that you can that. get them out of their element, get them uncomfortable, uh, nervous ticks. I think of Sheldon Cooper when I think of people with idiosyncrasies. That guy has them in spades. He has all of them. <laughs> Identic memory, brilliant, socially awkward. <laughs> so you can do that with your characters. And you wanna make sure that you give enough physical traits for your readers to have a really good image of them in your mind's eye. You don't have to describe every single detail about your character because you really don't want to info dump, but you wanna just kind of develop them as they go where you kind of give more information about what they might look like so that they can create them in their own mind. And I, when I, Got ready to do my book covers. I said to my book cover designer, I don't want people in my book cover because I don't want to give the reader an image. I want them to find the image on the pages. And that's what worked for me. So we went with symbols on our book covers. And you want to make sure your characters can relate to the society in which they live. Because if they're unrelatable to the society that they're in, it may be possible that they're unrelatable to your readers as well. So what does your character want? And why do they want it? And how are they gonna get it? And that's some of the things you have to figure out early. What are they willing to do to get it? Sometimes it becomes a battle of personal ethics. How bad do I wanna know about Bigfoot? Um, what are their histories? Again, you don't wanna info them, but you as the author need to know what their history is. One of the things I was doing as I was developing Lauren and Rowan's relationship was I actually went back to their first date and I wrote it. And I thought, well, this I can do this in a couple of pages. All right, just, just so I know what happened on their first date. 26 pages. It's never appeared in print and may never appear in print. But I know what their first date was like. So if I refer to it, I have a source document and I won't get lost. Um, so you need to know what their history is. I know Lauren's whole history because she's got a really troubled family. Her father left before she was born. Her mother and her are not close. And she has a meddling brother who always swore he was going to find aliens before she did to tease her. And now he's a, a radio astronaut developer, radio telescope developer for NASA. So he's got a pretty good chance of beating her to the punch. And that drives her crazy. And she can't stand him because he's picked at her like that her whole life. And there's going to come a time when they're going to have to come together and work together to make the world safe. So that's going to be a lot of fun. That's book three. Um, what do they fear? What do they fear and why? Because you have to know why they're afraid. Lauren is terrified of caves and dark spaces, which is where they end up every single time. Why is she afraid of that? How do your characters all relate to one another? That's important because, again, your characters are a product of their environment, but they're also a product of the people they're around. They always say you become like the five people you hang around with the most. So your characters are going to play off of each other. So you need to know how they're going to relate to one another. And how honest is your character, both with themselves and with others? Do you have one character who lies every time? Even if it's the best of intentions. You have to keep that character true to that fact every time. They get a chance to say yes when they should say no. Why would they say yes otherwise? You know, you have to think about those things ahead of time. Um, should your readers trust those characters? You know, good people do bad things all the time. You know, there's a bag of diamonds there. Let's pick it up. Nobody will miss one, right? So, you know, well, well which character is going to do that? <laughs> You have to know that. And what would your characters like to change about themselves? Because the character may have some idiosyncrasies where they're not comfortable in their own skin. Ladies, we struggle with this in real life all the time. It's called imposter syndrome. I think guys have it too, to a lesser degree. But I think most of the girls I know, especially in my career, have had to face that. 
So we're just here because we got lucky or, you know, maybe we're not skilled enough to really be doing what we're doing, but here we are because, you know, somebody let us. And you have to fight that. So what, what would your character change about themselves if they could? <clears throat> then you have to get into conflict. And major conflict is going to see where your characters really lie, where their truths lie. It's the fire by which they're tested. So conflict is going to happen all the time. We have conflict in our own world every day. So look at those real life conflicts and see how those work. You know, Lauren not being able to get along with her brother is a big one. The way she can't get along with her mother is another one. But then there's also conflicts between her and her partner because she doesn't want the relationship to become known. There's conflict with the studio, the television network, because she's afraid they're going to get canceled because they never find anything. And so there's a lot of pressure. So you have to have a lot of conflict. And your characters have to try and they have to fail. And there's a cycle of that that you want to see in your books. So you want that appropriate level of try and fail so that they can finally overcome. Because if they, if they just overcome it easily, what's the point of the book? It should be hard to get what they want. It should be something that important. And are your major conflicts finally resolved at the end in such a way that it's satisfying to you? You want that. So make sure that it's satisfying. Is it universal enough that your readers will be able to relate to you and to your book? So you want to make sure that you write on a level that's good for everybody. You want to try to pull as many different kinds of people in as you can. Diversity in your characters helps a lot because that way other people can see themselves in the book. Um, <clears throat> as you come through and you create those incidents in the book, how does that address the conflict? Does it ramp it up? Does it break it down? How can you broaden the conflict? You always are working on that conflict throughout all your books. And are there secondary conflicts? Sometimes those are your minor plot stories, you know, your second line. And how do your characters grow and change? Because you do not want them to be the same at the end of the book as they are at the beginning. And the same is true if you write book series. You have to have an overlying, overarching goal for your character to be completely different by the end of the series as they were at the beginning which is what I'm working with now because I actually have 12 books already crafted in the series. <coughs> so I'm just now going back and editing because I have the first drafts already written. And I'm looking to build that conflict and to build that character growth for all my characters. And how ingenious are your characters in their efforts to overcome their problems? Because again, if it's easy, your readers aren't going to find it worth reading. You want to make it a challenge for them to overcome those kinds of Plot impacts your characters. It's what drives the story and keeps things moving. So whatever happens to your character and how they react is important. So you have to set up. That's basically the introduction of your characters into the story. Uh, it gives the reason the readers a reason to care about your characters. And you want them to care. Otherwise, why are they there? They're not going to read your book if they don't care about your character. So you have to bring them in. That's where you get the hook in. How are you going to hook that reader in? And you do that by giving them a question that you swear you're going to answer. So in my third book, the very first line of the book is, aliens definitely exist. And that's the promise I'm making to my reader. I'm going to prove to you that aliens definitely exist. And they're here or they have been here. And that's the promise I make and that's my hope. And that's what drives the whole book. Then you have the inciting event, takes your character out of the status quo, gets them into conflict, gets them moving. You get the uh, roller coaster. I always think of my books as roller coasters. I'm looking at those tempo beats. How can I make that like anybody grew up writing the Zingo? Oh, yeah. I'm, I live in Oklahoma City now, but I grew up in Tulsa. So I grew up my first roller coaster with Zingo at Bell's Amusement Park. And all my books, I try to tempo it to the Zingo. <laughs> Because you have that slow tick, 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 up, go around the corner, and you go down, 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 and up, and up, and up, and around the corner, and around, and up, and over, and then back into the gate. Ooh, I ride. So you want to do that with your books. Get them to that climax, that up, 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 and you drop. And you let them go. And just it's so much fun. It's a wild ride. And then you have that resolution at the end where they're just sitting there going, man. I can't wait for the next one. <laughs> That's what you want. You want to get to the end of him and say, I can't wait for the next one. So good characters, again, are the product of a strong theme. What are the themes in your book? 
and themes of the story are the underlying philosophical arguments of your tale. And for me, my theme is the search for the truth and the truth that we can tell. Because again, I know not all truths are meant to be told. You want to have a likable protagonist who takes a powerful theme and that lingers with the readers long after the books are done. I love it when I get an email or a text message from a reader who's like, I finished your book like two or three months ago and I can't stop thinking about it. When's the next one coming out <laughs> and what happens? I love that because that tells me I did my job and my theme was strong. My characters were strong. So again, they have to be universal and relatable. And Shakespeare made, his, made every story an argument and the theme was central question to each of his themes. So, um, you know, to sleep for chance to dream. Um, and then again, do your characters change at all due to the influences of these new ideas and beliefs? So as Lauren explores her world and finds more truths, she's changing. She begins to understand that maybe science can't actually explain everything. There are things that she can maybe apply a scientific method to, but not always. I love this graphic, and I made sure you had a copy of it in the handouts. And if anybody wants uh, copies of those, I can email that to you. I'm happy to. Um, because I think this is a really good way of looking at how everything kind of ties together. You have your plot, you have your theme, and you have your character. And they all intermix like pieces of a puzzle. They all come together. So you have your plot, which is your external conflict, your outer problem, and then the internal conflict, which is part of the theme, which all ties into the character. So those are some things that you can take. And so I always use the math problem, plot plus character equals theme. And I always try to stick to that one more. And what's in a name? Have you ever thought about how you name your characters? And for me, this is one of the things I always struggle with is I, I have a character in mind, but I have to come up with a name. And that's usually where I get stuck. Oh, I gotta come up with another name. Oh, it's the hardest part. So what you can do is you wanna look at your genre, whatever you're writing, you should have some kind of a naming convention. If you're, if you're writing a modern day um, contemporary romance, you're probably not gonna name your character Thor. Well, maybe you might nowadays if you think goes, I think. But you know, you want to make sure that if you're writing science fiction, that you've got a really good science fiction name. Michael Valentine Smith, which is the character in Stranger in a Strange Land. First man born on Mars of human parents. So he's the only Martian. So that's the first Martian name ever. John Carter of Mars. Again, that's perfectly fine because he's from Virginia. But his love interest is Deja Thoris, the Princess of Mars. So she's got her own Martian name, and that works really well in that, in that genre. And you have to remember that you're the author. You don't actually get to name your characters. Their parents do. So you actually start have to thinking about who your parents were. I have a friend whose parents were hippies in the 70s, in the 70s and her name is Sunshine with a Y. And then she marries a guy named Mr. Goodfellow. So now her name is Sunshine Goodfellow. And we were out doing a presentation. I do safety training all the time. So we're out doing a presentation one day. And some guy in the back of the room, after she introduced herself, yells at her, how do you feel about, how do your parents feel about you working for the man? Because I work for the government. And she said, you know, both my parents work for first state government now. But back in the 70s, they were hippies. So you might want to think about that. Where, where were their parents at when they were doing picking that name? So their parents actually named the character, not you. And you want to name within your time zone. I'm a genealogist, so I love going through my family tree and pulling names out, but there's some of them I just can't use. Uh, I have an ancestor named Faithful. I have an ancestor named Pleasant. And my first thought when I see that is, well, if his name is Pleasant, what if he isn't Pleasant? What if he was a jerk? That could be an interesting character, but not for the genre that I'm writing in right now. Maybe when I go back to do some more historical fiction, I might go back and use faithful and pleasant, because what if they aren't? So uh, you want to pick names that are easy to remember. You don't want your people to, your readers to forget who your characters are. Oh, that, that character on page four. Oh, yeah. Yeah, the one that did this. Yeah. I don't remember their name, but that, that's a good character. Uh, you also want to think about pronunciation. I'm always thinking now about my audiobook narrator. 
I never thought about that when I first read the book, but I think about it now because I know some of her limitations and I don't ever want to give her a name she can't pronounce. Sometimes I have to send her recordings of this because I put charity in it. So I have to send her recordings of the pronunciations. Um, <clears throat> and then you want to make sure that if you use unusual names, that you use them appropriately and be careful with even the familiar names. I tend to find myself using the name John a lot, but I know a lot of Johns. I know a lot of Michaels. I know a lot of Laurens. Um, so those are some things that you just have to think of while you're planning your naming conventions and how you're going to characters. Now, I'm a, like I said, I'm a genealogist, so I go through my family tree and I pull names from there that I can use. Um, I also like to spend time in cemeteries. As a genealogist and a paranormal researcher, that's where the dead people are. So I spend a lot of time in there and I'm always taking my notepad because I'm finding some interesting names and I want to remember them and go back and use them. So I keep a list of names. So anytime I have to name a character now, I just go to my list. Oh yeah, that's the one. I'm done, move on. And then I'll have to get stuck, get stuck in the story. Um, baby name books. We don't do books anymore now. We just go online because you can find these online baby namers. And if you're looking for a certain era, you can just type in what name was popular in 1986. And it'll give you all the top 10 names for boys and girls in that era. And you can pull from that. Uh, I love random name generators. I was using those for a while until I started keeping my list. Um, census records, if you can read them, because a lot of them are handwritten. Some of them are poor copies. Uh, and again, your family trace was another place you could pull names from. So what's the difference in a name? How does that affect your character and who they become? What kind of a guy is Andrew Stoddress? Most handsome man I ever met, real person. Andre Snodgrass, poor kid, <laughs> he got stuck with that last name, but he had a beautiful first name. It matched him better than his last name. Uh, Joseph, give me some, who's that? It's actually a friend of ours. It's a real name. He's Native American, he's a cowboy. Goes out and ropes, ropes and ranches and does all the cowboy stuff. Uh, Bunny Rabbit, I know Bunny. Dusty Rhodes, people are cruel to their kids. You can be cruel to your characters, too. Uh, Bill Williams. How would you love to be Larry Derryberry? It's a real name. But then you get into some character names. Jane Rizzoli. Jane is a hard-boiled uh, Boston. Is it Boston cop? I think she's a Boston cop. Very plain, uh, beautiful woman. I mean, because it's, you know, she's a, she's, a, she's a cop. She's Italian. But her name suits her very much so. Uh, Derek Shepard, McDreamy, that's a better name. Uh, Mike Wazowski, fun names like I'm a Kulikowski, so I love throwing in those long Polish names. And again, I have to think about my audiobook narrator and my reader. So I have to make sure that they're ones that are easy to pronounce. Kids can say Mike Wazowski, use it. It's perfectly fine. Damien Bettencourt, it's my favorite evil villain name. It's one of mine, so I wrote that guy. And then Johnny Ringo, Cowboy, Tombstone, Arizona. That tells you a lot about the character. So think about the names when you're when you're coming up with them. Don't make it just an arbitrary decision. Make it be a reason for the name. So I'm going to do just a little quick character study again. Just forgive me because this is the character I know better than anybody. This is Lauren Grayson. She's a biological anthropologist. She's a television host. She's a paranormal investigator. Strong woman. Um, <clears throat> Go ahead and that. So some of the things about Lauren, she was born in Tahlequah, Oklahoma. I always try to use Oklahoma history whenever I can in my books because this is where I was born and raised. I wasn't born here, but this is where I was raised. Um, so she is of Cherokee descent. Uh, one of the reasons I did that is I have Cherokee family history that was whitewashed. Somebody lied to get off the tribal rolls. And so now I cannot go back and put my Cherokee even though my great grandmother spoke Cherokee and I learned some of it from her. So that's one of the reasons why I wanted to make sure I had a character who was proud of her heritage because somebody in our family was not. Her father left before she was born and she blames herself. She presumes that her father left because of her. He didn't need a girl, he already had six sons. Why would he need a daughter? So he hid the road. 
She has a PhD. She has that pesky brother who's always trying to run up her, one up her. She loves to do field research, but she hates being stuck in a lab. Hates being stuck in an office. Uh, she used to work for the television program Nova. She did a study on wolves in Yellowstone where she lived for two years. And so that way she was doing field research and she survived a grizzly bear attack. Now, not all of this has ended up in the books yet. It will come to fruition at some point. Uh, she has an impeccable bump of direction. She can't get lost. She can travel through the jungles without a compass and come out within 50 yards of where she meant to be. Um, she believes in science and the scientific methods. See, some of the things that Lauren does, and I make lists of what my character does and doesn't believe or do. Um, yeah, you can go ahead. Uh, she does believe that her father left before she was born because of her, and she hates her mother for that, and she blames her brother because she doesn't have a good relationship with her mother. Uh, she loves her job probably more than her boyfriend, and she does love her job. She loves what she does, and it's searching for the truth. Now, she does not believe in the supernatural or the paranormal, even with everything that she's seen, because she can't prove it with the scientific method. She doesn't want to get married or have kids because she believes that would mess up her life. Uh, she does trust, she does not trust the truth when she finds it. She thinks, okay, maybe I just imagined this, and even if it is the truth, I can't tell it. And she trusts that the network will, will not continue to fund her if she doesn't find something. So that's one of the myths that she's fighting, is that she's going to get canceled. All right. By the end of the book, she finds her real superpower. And oh, your character should have some kind of a superpower, even if it's not a supernatural superpower. They should have some kind of a superpower. She discovers she really does love her boyfriend more than the job. And she realizes that getting married won't mess that up. She admits that she's vulnerable, but not <coughs> true strength. She discovers the truth is important, but not everybody needs to know it. She does not resolve the conflicts with her family in the first book and saving them for later. She does not tell the truth of what she's found. But she doesn't give up on her search for the truth because she still feels like it's important. <clears throat> so this is actually something that I like to do because I'm a teacher. Obviously, I'm not on stage, so I'm not preaching, but I'm definitely a teacher. Um, let me look at the time. How we're doing? Okay. Um, if you've got a notepad, I just want you to jot down a quick character. I want you to develop a good guy, and I want you to develop a bad guy. First thing you need to come up with is their name. Now, I've got this picture up here because I want you to remember, you can't take a good guy and slap a goatee on him and make him a bad guy. <laughs> well, like the this spot. Um, so think a little bit about what they look like and kind of just jot down a couple of quick uh, visuals for us. And then why are they the hero of their story? And what are their special skills or weaknesses and quirks? And then just a really quick backstory. Just two, three lines, where they come from, what they're all about, something about them that makes them interesting. So let's take a minute and do that. And then if anybody's got one and you're ready, just raise your hand and I'll let you tell us all about it. Better. Anybody got somebody? Ask you a question. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, let's get to the next question. Just before I forget, uh -huh. what made you make her have a pes pesky brother? Is that oh, that, you that's got? actually a really good story where why Lauren has a pesky brother. Um, I had originally written the story. I actually wrote it. 
around 2009, so about 10 years before I ever really did anything with it. Um, and she did have six brothers, but I didn't have the Kesky brother aspect in there. Um, and I had an opportunity to go on a writer's cruise, which was a small intensive workshop. And uh, local author Barry Friedman was one of my coaches. And we were sitting down at a round table one day talking about why. And they kept asking me, why? Why is everyone this way? Why, why, why? And it's really challenging me to kind of rethink some of her backstory and some of her characterization. And I said something about, you know, well, she's got, this, she's got these brothers and she doesn't like her mother. And he goes, no, no, no. She needs a pesky sister who's always the fly in her ointment. And I said, well, she doesn't have any sisters. She's got six brothers. He goes, pick one of them. He's the, he's, he's the fly in her ointment. Well, that would be Michael, star of the football team, honor society, got his PhD before she did, then he's gonna get another one, and he's he's with NASA and he's gonna find aliens before she does. He's like, that's it. I came back from that cruise and completely rewrote book three. It was already written. So I could put Michael in there. That's it out here on the table. And that is my favorite book so far because of that relationship between them. I have a pesky brother and I knew what that was like. I was able to relate to that and my readers can relate to that. And the, the reviews I'm getting back because book three just came out a couple months ago are, oh my gosh, just the interpersonal relationship with Gordon and Michael makes this book worth reading because I have a brother just like that or I have a sister just like that or I'm the brother. And that, that always gets me. When I get that. So that's a great question. Yeah. <coughs> You'll find little nuggets like that and you grab those nuggets. Just one, you know, somebody made a joke, became a character that turned into a book. And, you know, that's just how it happens. Anybody else have questions? Or you got a character ready to talk about? Come on, somebody's got to have something. Just one. What'd you name your good guy? May. That's a good, 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 good guy name. What's the bad guy's name? Nelson. Nelson. <laughs> First thing I think of. Perfect. Yes. All right. Anybody else got a good guy, bad guy name? Frank Morris. Frank Morris. That's your good guy? And your bad guy? Preach Preston. Preach Preston. All right. I like it. Just a based on the people. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Sounds good. What else? I saw somebody else had a hand up. Anybody else had a good guy, bad guy in the want share? Yeah. That Damien Bettencourt. He's bad. He's bad. Bad, bad, bad. Did and you know anybody named Damien? I actually do know a guy named Damien. He's actually the wife. But he always gets the bad rap because he never does what he's supposed to do. He's a nice guy. He just doesn't make good choices. So when I was writing Damien, I used some of that. But yeah, Damien Bettencourt. Just sounds bad. It's like Lucifer Morningstar. Just sounds evil. All right. Um, tell me a little bit about what your characters look like. What's your good guy look like? Don't make me guess, because I will. May is science. She's redheaded. She's diminutive. She is a science teacher. Science teacher, redheaded, small. Fixer. She's a, a fixer. fixer. I like that. Fixer. Okay. And then the bad guy? Um, he's slick. Slick. He's uh, he believes in second chances. Second chances. But he's abandoned his daughter. Okay. And is off trying to find himself. Find himself. So he's put everybody else behind himself. He's number one. That's a that's a very good character element. Fantastic. I like that. Yep. Uh, what kind of weakness or quirk does May have? May. Uh huh. She's a science teacher. Like She's a science teacher, but she doesn't like kids. Little kids. Little kids. She really doesn't like the daughter, the Nelson's daughter that she's now having to raise. Yeah. yeah, okay. I like that. And what's, what's uh, I guess his quirk is he's out trying to find himself. Does he have any other quirks? Women. Women eyes are. Yeah, doesn't necessarily need last names. Okay, don't need, to know, don't need to know their last name. Love them and leave them. Okay. That's a great, that's a great juxtapose because he's already left the kid, right? So it applies to everybody. Strong, very strong. 
And then a little bit of that, we kind of heard some of the backstory on that. Anybody else have another example they can share on characterization that they come up with? Well, I based my, uh, my bad guy on my own father. Okay. Uh, he was a uh, <clears throat> retired pastor. Okay. And he preached on the weekend, and he was a serial killer during the week. Preached on the weekend and was a serial killer during the week. So he had. I cannot was, wait to read that book. It is called a killer in no. I forget which book that is. That is called uh, apostolic murders. The apostolic murders. Okay, exactly. You see, you see, though, that what I'm trying to help you get through is to find those those little quirks, is that those little nuggets that make your characters rich. Hold on to those when you find them. Find them in your own life. Find them in the lives of others. Find them in literature. You know, I pulled from ancient Greek mythology. My last semester of college, I just finished my degree two years ago. It took me 30 years to get my two-year degree, but I did it. <laughs> um, was ancient medieval history and mythology. So I had to have a humanities credit. And so I really started paying attention to mythology and pulling elements from mythology into my books because some of mine have some already pretty strong mythos in them. So there's lots of different ways that you can find those elements. All right, go ahead, let's move on. I'll wrap it up. So again, remember you wanna make sure you have a character versus a caricature. You wanna make sure that your characters are realistic and multidimensional. They have to be relatable to a wide audience so that you can reach out and bring in more readers uh, in the world. And always think about your villains from the get-go. Don't wait until you need them to start creating your villain. You want to make sure your heroes are likable. And even your villains can have some elements that make them redeeming, that make your characters like them. Um, I think even some of the worst bad guys out there we like because we can relate to them. Don't be afraid to play with that unreliable narrator. And you don't have to have your main character be your hero. That's okay. You can play with that. Um, side characters need to serve a purpose. They need to have a role and fill a gap that the main character can't. And a good name can make or break your character. So pay attention to that. And always remember plot plus character plus theme. So any questions for me? I've thrown a lot of information at you in a very short period of time. Yes. I... So uh, when you're writing uh, a Mm -hmm. Right. How how do you get the background of the Okay, so how do I how do I write characters that are not like me? And, and I, I'm a historian and a, a genealogist, so I pay attention to people. I'm also a trained investigator. I've done interviews, murder fatalities, death fatalities. Um, so I learned to study the human condition and watch people and how they act. Um, when I'm dealing with people from other cultures, I usually draw from cultures that I have some relationship to in some way. I actually have a friend in South Africa. He's actually in China now, but he lives in South Africa, or lived in South Africa, he's from there. So I asked a lot of questions, kind of got to know the culture, uh, asked some, for some of their family stories, just spent a lot of times not really interviewing, but just getting to know them and talking to them, uh, trying to learn you know, why they were the way they were, and maybe pull some of those elements in. Um, when it came to the South African connection, that actually started because um, my boss, when I started to work at the Department of Labor back in 1989, had a book in his office that was an astronomy book. And he let me borrow it one day, and I found one of my ancestors cited in the book as one of the greatest astronomers in, from South Africa in his day. And I found a picture of him with his name, and I'm like, oh my gosh, I think that's somebody that's in my family tree. And I started researching and it was able to make the connection. So that's why I haven't said it in South Africa. It's like I have a connection there. I'm just a little bit of an idiot. Uh -huh. And I told you the name of that book was The Apostolic Murders. It's not. Okay. <laughs> that was my working title. Okay. It okay, published okay. as The Apostle Murders. The Apostle Murders. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Nobody knows what apostolic is. <laughs> Very good. All right, other questions? I have a question. Okay. okay. Uh, the slide you have at uh, by the end of book one, uh -huh. you put what love does not. Have you yes. decided that way on early on? Before I am a 100% cancer. Okay. I didn't decide anything when I started. I was going to write a book about what if they can't, what if they go looking for Bigfoot and they actually find it? What's going to happen? I always start my books with what if. And that was the what if. What if we find Bigfoot? So that's kind of how that started. And, and like I said, I wrote it 10 years ago. So I went through lots of revisions. I went through a critique group. Uh, and then when I got my publishing deal, 
you know, went through the whole editing process and went through a lot of the what if, you know, why did you do this? What's for goal? What, 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 what? And it really made me sit down and rethink the character because I hadn't really given the character that much thought. So those characters have evolved even in, in the evolution of the book, those characters have evolved and I've gone back in and rewritten some things. So yeah, it's never what I intended, especially not by book three, but uh, I'm really pleased with how it's going. So, yeah. How would you play with the like good guy protagonist also being like their own bad guy, mm -hmm. like uh, bipolar disorder, uh, self sabotage? Yeah, you know, mental issues are very interesting to write because there's going to come a time where we're going to have a character descend into madness. And so I do a lot of research on the actual symptoms and what the what the presentation of that mental illness might be. And, you know, kind of like Gollum, switching back and forth between good guy versus bad guy. That's always kind of the character I think of when I think about descending into madness. And so, you know, this definitely a schizophrenic break. And, you know, I'm, I'm not a psychologist. I didn't play one on TV and I didn't stay at Holiday and Express last night, but I know a psychologist. So I asked, okay, as this character descends into madness, what has to happen and what is that going to look like? And so I did a lot of what if studies with her. Um, so, you know, you find your friends and you take their skills and borrow from them because you may not have that skill. So that's what worked for me. Anyone else? Anyone, anyone? All right. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate everybody having me out today. You've been an attentive audience. So I've got questions on the table. I'm glad to answer any questions you have. For everybody to go, I just want to thank you on behalf of Tess and High Fighters, and thank you everybody here for being so attentive. And I've learned so much from you, and just want to learn. Oh, thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. Oh. Right back there. Like a few more people are coming in. Well, I'll, I'll pause it. There's some handouts over there on that back row if you'd like to pick one up. Start with your name again. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for coming. Um, Self-editing is the practice of editing your own manuscript before submitting it to an agent, editor, or publisher, or before self-publishing. Every writer approaches the process differently depending on skill level, but any self-editing you can do will save time and money in the overall publishing process. Today, I'll, I'll be giving you a broad overview of editing and sharing some of the most common mistakes to be on the lookout for as you self-edit. We don't have time to cover each one in depth, but this session will provide an introduction as well as resources for further study. I'm going to deviate a little from the handout, but all the information is here, so you shouldn't have to take notes. And because we have so much to cover, sorry, but I need to ask you to please save your questions for later. My email address is at the top of the first page, and I want you to feel free to message me if you have any questions. How many nonfiction writers are here today? Most of what we're going to cover pertains to fiction, but bear in mind that many tips for writing fiction can and should be used in certain types of nonfiction. Hopefully, there'll be something here for everyone. We all know the five general steps of the writing process. Pre-writing, drafting, revising, editing, and publishing. Since the process is recursive, one step feeds into another, and the steps can be repeated infinitely. Thus, all writers revise as they write. But formal editing is typically done after revising, even though you know, some of us refer to all revision as editing. Uh, it can be limiting to try to edit while writing because writing is a creative process and editing a logical and analytical one. 
No one piece of advice works for everyone, but writing first and editing later is probably the most efficient approach. Then if you discover you need to add a paragraph or rewrite a chapter, return to the pre-writing and drafting stages. Instead of thinking of self-editing as a one-time event, consider it an ongoing process in which you focus on one editing stage or one item or problem at a time. Editors sometimes define the stages differently, and there's a lot of overlap, but in general, there are four stages. In order from the most comprehensive to the least comprehensive, they are developmental or big picture editing, line editing or line by line editing, copy editing, which is uh, fine tuning and proofreading, the final checks. You don't have to follow the developmental line copy proof sequence, but if you copy edit and proofread first and then you make significant revisions, you'll just have to copy edit and proofread again. So following that order saves time. Editing is a time consuming and detailed process. Uh, a book can take several months. Uh, on average, expect to spend an hour for every two to five pages, but heavily edited manuscripts will take longer. And writers always ask how many times they should self-edit. Edit as many times as it takes to present your work in the best possible light. In other words, repeat each stage until you're no longer making broad changes and multiple corrections on each page, and make a second pass over any heavily edited pages. It's okay to use editing software such as Grammarly or ProWriting Aid and your computer's built in spell check, but consider them only one tool in your arsenal. They are not infallible and they can't write for you, even though they will help you save time and help you become a better writer. Uh, for example, they won't pick up on words used incorrectly, character inconsistencies or plot holes. When it comes to self-editing, there really are no shortcuts. You just have to do the work. Plan on taking two approaches. The first is to read through your manuscript sequentially line by line. The second is to conduct separate sweeps. A sweep is a technique that involves, in, that, uh, involves looking at one item or problem at a time, such as quotation marks, the capitalization of free words or passive voice. You can conduct a sweep during any stage, but it's particularly helpful when copy editing and proofreading for fine details. On page three of your handout, I've listed 22 tips for editing and proofreading. I won't go over the whole list, but one of the most beneficial things you can do is let your work rest before you self-edit. A major requirement of editing is being able to look at your writing with a fresh perspective and an unbiased opinion. So after completing your first draft, step away from it for as long as you can to create some distance and objectivity. The longer you can wait, the better. If you can wait three months, great. If you're pressed for time, however, like most of us are, then take as much time off as you can, even if it's only overnight. You'll catch a lot more mistakes that way. Then, after taking time off, return to your manuscript to tackle the first stage, the developmental edits. Developmental editing is sometimes called stylistic, substantive, content, or story editing. It involves looking at a manuscript as a whole to evaluate what works and what doesn't, focusing on big picture elements such as character, plot, and organization. This requires a basic knowledge of the craft of writing, all the elements and strategies that make something readable and enjoyable. So I'm coming here today, you're already on the right track. So pat yourself on the back. <laughs> on page five of your handout, I've listed nine elements of craft to consider when self-editing. We could spend days covering each one, which unfortunately is beyond the scope of this presentation. But please notice that punctuation, word choice, 
and grammar fall under style. There's a good reason for this. Writing consists of many gray areas in which there are no hard and fast rules. Consequently, writers sometimes have to make stylistic choices in things like punctuation. And these choices become part of their voice. Page six of your handout contains a simplified developmental editing checklist. Editing is complex, so use checklists at every stage of the process to help remember important details. Uh, during your developmental edits, you're going to check story arc, word count, characters, point of view, plot, settings, story flow and pacing, scene openings and endings, theme, and consistency and clarity. Your handout also lists two books with developmental checklists if you want a more comprehensive checklist. The first is Developmental Editing by Scott Morgan. The second is Listen of Writer, How Not to Write Like an Amateur by Nikki Hanna. Beneath that on your handout are three online resources, as well as nine book recommendations for further study of the craft if you're unfamiliar with any of those nine elements. Before we go on, I want to point out two more tips for page four. The first is read aloud as you self-edit. Reading aloud makes mistakes easier to spot than reading silently because it engages multiple senses, your sight and your hearing. When you read your work aloud or you have someone read it to you, you'll particularly notice flaws in the flow, rhythm, and coherence of your writing. You'll notice whether your pace is too fast or too, too slow. You'll hear whether your transitions are smooth. The second tip is always edit with the reader in mind. That might seem obvious, but there are so many rules. It's easy to forget that a writer's job is to make the reader's job easy and enjoyable. Following the rules is important, but when choosing upon, among multiple or optional stylings, ask yourself how the reader will experience what you've written. Let meaning, readability, and clarity be your guides. Next, consider flow and voice. For example, sometimes there's more than one correct way to punctuate a sentence. Does your punctuation or lack of punctuation make the meaning clear? Does it make the reader's job easier or harder? Read the sentence aloud. How does your punctuation affect flow and pacing? Could the sentence be restructured in accordance with standard rules of punctuation? to improve readability, flow, and clarity. Finally, ask yourself if your punctuation fits your unique writer's voice. For instance, the comma after an introductory phrase of fewer than three words is sometimes optional. Uh, here's an example. Before the movie, comma, let's get some popcorn. Or before the movie, let's get some popcorn. No comma. Those two sentences read differently. The comma creates a pause and suggests different intonation. Uh, when faced with a choice like, like this, ask yourself how you want your character to come across and what message you're trying to convey. Okay, now that you have a few more tips under your belt, let's get back to the developmental edit. As part of this edit, we visit the beginning, middle, and end of your work. And the book Listen Up Writer contains checklists for those parts. Your beginning is the first thing busy editors or agents will read after your synopsis. If they like it, they might skip to the end to see how the end connects with the beginning. If they like that, they might skip to the middle to see how that reads. But if your middle sags, they might decide reading your entire work is worth your time. The assumption being, of course, that readers will lose interest in quick reading. Therefore, the book won't sell. Nail the beginning and you'll potentially land yourself a sale, a reader, and maybe even a career. Revise your first line, your first paragraph, and your first chapter, making every word count. As Ursula K. Le Guin said in The Fisherman's Daughter, First doors are lines to worlds. 
And there are several famous first lines on your handout on page nine, uh, but one in particular illustrates your point. You better not tell nobody but God. It'd kill your enemy. Does anyone recognize that? The color purple by Hal Swan. That, that first line contains all four elements of a good opening line. A distinctive voice, a clear point of view, and hints of plot and characterization. Make sure your beginning contains those four elements, as well as the elements of a good first paragraph, which are, of course, a good opening line, setting, and a hint of conflict, unless there's some reason to withhold that information to create suspense or surprise. If your beginning doesn't grab you, ask yourself if you've started it in the right place. Um, on page 10 of your handout, I listed three different approaches. One of the biggest mis mistakes I see in beginnings is telling too much too soon. Remember, in order to read your story, readers don't need to know everything you needed to know to write it. Trim the parts that obscure the action so you can get to the, the big story, the inherent drama faster. The parts that typically get in the way are backstory, description, especially information dumps, and the main character's inner monologue. Does anyone want a definition of information dump? Sure, what is it? <laughs> you've, heard, you've heard the advice to show and tell. An info dump is basically all tell and no show. It's the act of dumping information about something such as a character or a setting all in one place instead of sprinkling it throughout. Print out your opening pages and go through them, marking up the text in different colors to distinguish between backstory, description, and inner monologue. Those are the parts you might be able to cut and save for later. Okay. If you want to learn more, a good book is The Writer's Guide to Beginnings, How to Craft Story Openings That Sell by Paul Meunier. After going over your beginning with a fine-tooth comb, take, devote extra time to the end of your work. Make sure the connection between your ending and your beginning is clear. Your original plans can change as you write. Uh, what you thought you were writing about in the beginning might not be what you end up with. That's just part of the creative process of writing. And that's why it's, it can be so hard to quote edit while writing. Uh, section 7.2.4 on page 11 of the handout list the general ways to end works of fiction and nonfiction with examples of each. Notice the way successful writers in their, in their works. It's impossible to be a great writer without reading great writing. Uh, you'll also see a list of, uh, a list of the characteristics of good fiction and nonfiction endings. Make sure what you've written meets, meets those criteria. A good fiction ending has to evoke emotion. That's a given. Some types of nonfiction can and also should evoke emotion. Uh, I'm thinking of memoir, for, for instance. One of the biggest mistakes I see is either the absence of mood and emotion or merely naming a character's emotion instead of showing it in such a way that readers experience that emotion. Uh, uh, for example, happiness. Instead of writing, being outside makes Sarah feel happy. Right, the corners of Sarah's mouth lifted as she closed her eyes and tilted her face toward the sun. The latter sentence puts the reader in, in her shoes and more fully immerses the reader in the story. And when readers connect in this way, they keep reading. And remember, a writer's job is to keep readers reading. I'll cover more about showing emotion later because it's so important. A good ending should also give readers what they'll want or need in order to feel, if not happy as in happily ever after, 
that at least satisfied. Ask yourself if your ending meets that criterion. When you finish putting your ending through the ringer, make sure you kept the middle of your work and moving. Every chapter, scene, paragraph, and word should move the story forward toward its conclusion. Likewise, dialogue should advance your plot by developing characters and showing relationships. The crucial task in the middle is to connect every element. Often middle sad because the writing has lost direction and purpose. Paragraphs, scenes, and characters need purpose. Fiction writers stay focused on eventual character goals while building to the climax. Examine your pacing, tension, and conflict. And if you're unfamiliar with those elements, a helpful book is Conflict and Suspense by James Scott Bell. Nonfiction writers remain focused on supporting your main idea. On page 13 in section 7.4, you'll find more ways to revive a flagging middle. One obvious way to do that is to shorten it to advance more swiftly to resolution. You can do that by deleting inessential content. As Stephen King said in On Writing, A Memoir of the Craft, kill your darlings, even when it breaks your egocentric little scribbler's heart. Get rid of non-essential description, characters, dialogue, and whole chapters, no matter how much you love them. Make sure the content is relevant and advances your message. For example, after I wrote the speech, I had to cut over 3,000 words because I kept diverging from my key points. We all do this. It's a very common mistake. In addition to eliminating inessential content, get rid of inconsistencies. There can be inconsistencies in several big picture elements, such as characterization, plot, and setting. But I want to emphasize maintaining a consistent point of view or POV, because the unskillful handling of POV is such a common mistake. It can cause an agent or an editor to relegate your main script to the reject pile after reading all the other characters. This is because in order for a story to sell, Readers must be able to connect with it in some way. And all writers develop that connection through point of view. If your point of view is inconsistent, then readers might lose interest or get confused and quit reading. Point of view, of course, refers to who's telling or narrating the story, as well as the relationship that narrator has to the characters in the story. Page 14 of your handout lists the five basic points of view and great books written from each. The three, let's review the three main types. They are first person, which is written from the writer's point of view and uses I, me, I, and we. Second person, which is directed at the reader and uses you. And third person, which is told from an outside narrator's point of view and uses he, she, they, and it. Depending on the topic, purpose, and audience, Nonfiction writers can use first, second, or third point of view. Fiction is usually written from first or third point of view, though not always, with third being the most widespread. A third, and a third person narrator can take many forms. Uh, the most common is limited third person, and that's what I'm going to focus on because so many writers have difficulty. The limited narrator is limited in the sense that although he has access to one or more viewpoint characters, thoughts, and feelings, he's not all-knowing or omniscient. An example of a multi multiple viewpoint story is Catherine Stockett's The Help. How many of you have read that? It has three viewpoint characters, Minnie, Skeeter, and Abel, Abelian. Whether you're self-editing a story from one character's perspective or from multiple perspectives, be certain each paragraph and scene is written from the viewpoint of only one character. One way to spot inconsistent point of view is to look at your pronoun usage to ensure you aren't combining different viewpoints in the same paragraph or scene. Here's a limited third person example from section 9.1.8 on page 16 of the handout. The original version had only one character, David. 
I rewrote it to illustrate an inconsistent point of view. The confusing pronouns are underlined. Davy ran to the driveway, fishing in his pocket for the keys. When my eyes lit on his dad's new monster truck, my breath caught. It was the shiniest, blackest, most ginormous truck I'd ever seen. His heart pounded as he scrambled into the driver's seat. Who's telling that story? Davy, his, which is third person, or I, my, which is first person. That passage is an example of what's known as head hopping, because it jumps from Davy's head into someone else's. Here's another way to spot inconsistent point of view. Readers should be able to access only the viewpoint characters, thoughts, emotions, and sensory impressions. Readers can't access the inner workings of non-viewpoint characters. But in the example, we can access both Davy's emotions, his heart pounded and he scrambled into the driver's seat, and someone named I's thoughts and emotions. My breath caught, and it was the most ginormous truck I'd ever seen. That passage should be rewritten as, David ran to the driveway, fishing in his pocket for the keys. When his eyes lit on his dad's new monster truck, his breath caught. It was the shiniest, blackest, most ginormous truck he'd ever seen. His heart pounded as he scrambled into the driver's seat. I'm going to continue reading because in a minute, I'm going to add a non-viewpoint character so you can see the difference. Breathing in the scent of leather, he started the engine and ripped. The shoveling growled like a T-Rex. Okay, now let's add a non-viewpoint character to the scene. So we're going to start a new paragraph. The front door of the house flew open with a bang and George darted onto the porch in his boxer shorts. He ran down the porch steps, waving his arms and shouting, no, Davy, stop. George is a non-viewpoint character, so we can't access his thoughts and emotions. We can only infer his inner workings from his actions through dialogue or via the main character's thoughts about him. What if there were two viewpoint characters in this story, Davy and someone else? Every time the viewpoint character changes, you must insert a section break and start a new scene, or skip to the next page and start a new chapter. That extra white space you add to the page before a new scene or chapter cues readers that a change is about to take place and gives them time to process what they've read and prepare for what's to come. Point of view is complex and we've only scratched the surface, but you'll find more information in your handout. And a good book on this subject is Characters, Emotion, and Viewpoint by Nancy Kress. Weak beginnings, middles, and ends, inessential content, and inconsistent point of view are some of the most common mistakes to look for during your developmental edits. Now let's move on to the line edits. Line editing is exactly what it sounds like. Examining your manuscript line by line, focusing on craft elements such as writing style, word choice, uh, sentence and paragraph structure and flow, redundancies, and clarity. During the line edits, you'll zero in on consistency of presentation. So it's important to use a style guide from the outset. A style guide is a publication that guides editors and writers in grammar, spelling, punctuation, word usage, formatting, and other questions that come up because of the variance and fluidity of the English language. Uh, tons of style guides have emerged to define standards for distinct types of writing, and all publishers have, have what's known as an internal house style guide or an HSG. Most writers will encounter four commonly used style guides, AP, CMS, MLA, and APA. Base your choice of guide on what you're writing and where it will be published. For example, journalists, bloggers, and content marketers use AP style or the Associated Press style. The most widely used guide is CMS, which stands for the Chicago Manual of Style and is often simply referred to as Chicago style. It's used by print publishers in both fiction and nonfiction and many academic journals in the humanities. The other two most commonly used guides are MLA, the Modern Language Association's Handbook, 
and APA, the publication of the American Psychological Association. You'll find more information about all four style guides on page 20 of your handout with links for their online versions. Nonfiction writers. Section 22 on page 41 contains information about citation manuals. Improperly cited references are a common mistake that will diminish your credibility and authority as an author. So use a manual and check the styling of your citations carefully. Consistency in presentation also refers to using the same terminology and styling when referring to the same word, phrase, or idea. For example, if you saw type 1 diabetes with an Arabic numeral 1, they consistently use the Arabic numeral instead of switching to the Roman numeral symbol uh, uh, 1, which looks like an I. Okay. If there's more than one correct styling, then either pick either uh, the most common or your preferred one and use it throughout. Okay. Once you've chosen a style guide, you're ready to begin the line edits. Keep a dictionary close at hand so you can look up any word you're not 100% sure of. A uh, thesaurus comes in handy too for finding synonyms or overused words. And we'll talk more about this uh, using a thesaurus later. Now let's go over some of the most common mistakes to be on the lookout for. The first is inconsistent verb tense on page 22. Verb tense lets readers know when an action takes place. Let's review the three most basic tenses. Simple past, they walked. Simple present, they walk. And simple future, they will walk. When writing a scene for a novel, pick the verb tense and stick with it. Tense consistency refers to keeping the same tense throughout a clause. Shifting tense without a good reason is confusing to readers. As you read each sentence during your line edit, highlight all the verbs or action words. If the time frame for each action or state is the same, make sure you haven't switched from one tense to another within the same clause. For example, Julie finished typing the outline, brushes her hair, and went out for dinner. That's one clause or complete sentence, but the tenses are mixed. Finished past, brushes present, and went past. That sentence should read, Julie finished typing the outline, brushed her hair, and went out for dinner. Now all three verb tenses are the same. Finished past, brushed past, and went past. 11.3 of the handout contains more examples of how to correct inconsistent verb tense. Uh, when, editing, when editing for tense, flashbacks can be difficult, especially if you're writing in past tense. This is because you have to switch to past perfect tense, which means using the verb had, as in he had walked. It's easy to overuse had, which quickly becomes monotonous and repetitive for readers. So I've listed some tips for editing flashbacks on your handout. When editing your language, also weed out unnecessary adverbs. In his memoir, Stephen King compared adverbs to dandelions. He said, if you have one in your lawn, it looks pretty and unique. If you fail to root it out, however, you find five the next day, 50 the day after that. And then, my brothers and sisters, your lawn is totally completely and profligately covered with dandelions. By then, you see them for weeks. They really are. King deliberately used three adverbs in a row, totally, completely, and profligately, as part of his style and voice to make a point. Writers often overuse adverbs, which weakens their writing. In the King quote, those three adverbs modify verb covered. But adverbs can also describe or modify adjectives, other adverbs or whole sentences. Uh, as in the, uh, they often end in ly, as those three did in the King quote, but not always. For example, watch out, he said very loudly. And that sentence, the adverb very describes the adverb loudly. Look for adverbs attached to verbs of attribution, such as said in the example, and replace the adverbs with one stronger verb. You could rewrite that sentence. Watch out, he screamed. 
And don't rely on an advert to do the work that dialogue should be doing. Instead of writing, I've had enough, Jim said angrily, angrily is your adverb, write, you disgust me, Jim said, this conversation is over. As illustrated by the King quote, however, sometimes adverbs are useful. They can add conciseness, emphasis, they can paint a clearer picture, or enhance rhythm and repetition. Here's one example. I thought the book ended abruptly. What more can you say? Uh, another example is the use of gentle in this poem by Donna Thomas. Do not go gentle into that good night. Old age should rage and burn and close the day. Adverbs have their place in your bag of tricks, albeit a very limited one. But when in doubt, think of them as dandelions and weed them out. During the line edit, also make sure your language is concise. Being concise doesn't mean being abrupt. It means using the fewest possible words without sacrificing meaning, emotion, mood, flow, or voice. One technique for spotting wordy language is to analyze each sentence for working words, the words that carry the meaning versus blue words or sticky words, little words that hold working words together like the and a. Some blue words are essential, but it's easy to use too many. This blocks down the reader and slows the pace. Here's an example from 13.3 of your handout, page 25. The blue words are bold-faced. The girls are going to make a call to their mother in the event that the girls should get lost. That's a wordy sentence. It contains eight working words and 12 blue words. If you delete, delete them and read only the working words, you can still understand the sentence's meaning. The working words are girls, make, call, their mother, event, girls, and lost. Eliminate as many blue words as possible and you have, the girls will call their mother if they get lost. That's a concise sentence with six working words and only four blue words. The, will, if, and get. Uh, <coughs> the repetition of the girls in that wordy example is what's called an echo. And related to editing for concise language is eliminating unnecessary repetition and echoes. Careful writers use repetition to enhance their work without overusing words and phrases to the point of boring their readers. Poets, for example, use repetition to achieve resonance, as Robert Frost did in his poem, Stopping by Woods on a Snowy Evening. The woods are lovely, dark and deep, but I have promises to keep, and miles to go before I sleep, and miles to go before I sleep. Fiction and nonfiction writers some use repetition for effect and emphasis. Here's an example from J.D. Salinger's novel, The Catcher in the Rye. It rained on his lousy tombstone, and it rained on the grass on his stomach. It rained all over the place. Sloppy writers, on the other hand, use repetition unintentionally, repeating words or ideas that don't add to the overall meaning or impact of the piece. Look at the example on page 26, if you would please, 14.2. The repetitious words are underlying. That just might help you follow along a little better. He put his arm around her shoulders. She actually shrugged it off. He looked at her with his eyes. She smiled and walked ahead of him. He walked faster to catch up with her. Each paragraph in that example starts the same way. He put, she shrugged, he looked, which is repetitious. Consecutive sentences and paragraphs should start differently unless you're deliberately using repetition for effect. The second line contains an unnecessary adverb, actually. And actually also happens to be one of my crutch words. All writers have crutch words or favorite words that they tend to repeat. So sweep for your crutch words and make sure you haven't overused them. So the third line in the example is redundant and that it states the obvious. If he's looking at her, then he's obviously using his eyes. The last two sentences both contain the verb walked, which is a repetitive echo of the same word. Okay, there are several ways to fix a passage like that. For example, vary the sentence structure. 
When he put his arm around her shoulders, she shrugged it off. Get rid of the unnecessary adverb and the redundancy. Add an action beat that conveys his emotion via body language. Looking at her, he raised an eyebrow. Replace the weak verb walk with a stronger one that shows her emotion. She smiled and strode ahead of him. Break up that repetitive he she pattern with dialogue and substitute another stronger verb for the boring verb walked to paint a more vivid picture for the reader. What's with you, he asked, jogging to catch up with her. A thesaurus is a one wonderful tool for replacing a repeated word such as walked in the example or for finding a more precise word. But make sure your synonym fits your voice and whatever you're writing. For instance, you wouldn't substitute perambulated walked in that example. One exception to eliminating unnecessary repetition is the repetition of said and asked in dialogue. Okay. A dialogue tag such as he said attributes a line of dialogue to a character so reader no, readers know who's speaking. That's why it's sometimes referred to as an attribution or a speech tag. As you saw in edit, keep in mind that reading dialogue should be a smooth experience with readers barely registering the tags. Tags are purely functional and should not take away from the readers. Experts advise using said or as most of the time because they're neutral. They don't draw attention to themselves, so they're almost invisible. Using a different tag for the sake of variety every time the character speaks, slows pacing, impedes readability, and sounds amateurish. For example, get out, John thundered. No, Mary responded. I won't tell you again, he articulated. Tell me as many times as you like, she retorted. Here, I'll pack for you, he ejaculated. <laughs> How many of you found yourself focusing on the tags instead of on the dialogue? <coughs> Everyone. Uh, if you're using tags like articulated and ejaculated in fiction writing, then it, then it might be time to burn your thesaurus. <laughs> Don't use tags too often, as the example does. Every line of dialogue does not require an attribution particularly not when there are only two characters in a scene. Use only enough tags to identify the speakers. On your handout, there's an example of using too few tags, too many, and then there's another example uh, that shows just about the right number of tags. Uh, don't, oh, and vary the placement of your dialogue tags. Don't place them all at the end, end of a sentence, as in the example. Use any tag other than said or asked infrequently and strategically for greater impact or precision. For example, instead of writing man overboard said, you might write man overboard, the crewman yelled. Remember though that the more you use the less common tag, the weaker it becomes, the less emotional impact it has. And make sure you're using bona fide dialogue tags, not non-speech verbs. Read, people cannot yawn, snore, or grin the words we say. Instead of writing, I'll see you in the morning, comma, Dana yawned, write, Dana yawned, period. I'll see you in the morning. The last example illustrates how to add variety by adding, by using action or description in place of a dialogue tag to indicate a speaker. Dana yawned is an action beat that reveals emotion, not a speech tag. But it clearly shows who's speaking, so it isn't necessary to tell the reader who said it. 16.2 on your handout contains more guidelines for using dialogue tags with examples of each. In addition to double checking your dialogue tags, search for opportunities to use show don't tell. Show don't tell is a technique that enables readers to experience a story through action, dialogue, thoughts, senses, and feelings rather than through the author's summarization. Nonfiction writers uh, can also use this technique. Russian playwright and short story writer Anton Chekhov described it perfectly when he, he advised his brother, an aspiring writer, to think of painting a picture for the reader. To paraphrase his words, don't tell me the moon is shining, show me the glint of light, broken glass. Bear in mind though, that just as all repetition isn't bad, all telling isn't bad. Telling, uh, the best writing layers, telling and showing, and telling is a critical component of both fiction and nonfiction. 
For example, it can provide a quick summary, as in John rushed through his morning routine and drove to the office. Uh, the details of John's routine are not important. Eliminating those details keeps the story moving forward. But telling and showing would be more effective is a common mistake. Showing is essential for pulling a reader in, for hooking in, and keeping him with you for the duration. Here's one example of turning telling into showing. Telling. John was so excited that he felt like he couldn't wait to get to the office. Showing. Sweat beaded on John's forehead as he raced to the office. The telling sentence contains four things that can be eliminated. A passive form of be verb plus a past participle, was excited, an unnecessary adjective, so, a filter word felt, and a named emotion, excited. Instead of naming an emotion, the showing example uses body language and stronger verbs. Does anyone want a definition of filter word? Yep. Filter words are extra explanatory words such as realized, felt, heard, thought, seemed, that distance a reader from a character's experience by filtering that the experience through the character. For example, in the sentence, Lisa heard the dogs barking, heard is the filter word. To put the reader in Lisa's shoes, rewrite that sentence to eliminate the filter word and you have the dogs barked. Now the reader is inside of Lisa's head, hearing what she hears. It isn't necessary to tell the reader that Lisa heard barking because the reader already knows that Lisa's in the scene. And when showing, remember to appeal to the five senses. Writers sometimes neglect this. Sweep your manuscript to make sure there's at least one sensory appeal on every page. Uh, for example, telling, she hated it there. Showing, the cigarette smoke made her pause mid stride and she grimaced. Did you notice the appeal to the sense of smell? Okay. Closely related to changing telling into showing is turning passive voice into active voice. In other words, right, the mother carried the baby active voice instead of the baby was carried in the mother's arms, passive voice. The sequence of the active voice example is the mother subject carried verb or action word, the baby object. So to write an active voice, you put the subject first and have it perform the action. Active voice makes your sentences stronger, shorter, and more precise. Using passive voice too much weakens your writing, slows the pace, and is a sign of an experience. How do you spot passive voice? In the passive voice example, the baby, the object, was carried, verb, in the mother's arms. Subject. Look at the placement of the subject, the mother's arms. Did it come first? No, it came last. The object, the baby, came first. Okay. That's one way to spot passive voice. Another dead giveaway was the form of the verb was plus the past participle carried. If you tend to overuse passive voice, sweep for passive sentences by searching for form of be verbs, am, is, are, was, and were. And ask yourself if is using active voice would be more effective. But using passive voice isn't always wrong. On page 33 of your handout, I've listed 12 instances in which passive voice could be both necessary and effective. For example, when making simple statements of fact, as in it was Sunday, or when it doesn't matter who the subject is, as in it was rumored that Elroy strangled his wife. And that is a excellent, an excellent example of using passive voice to create a narrative book. It draws the reader in and it make, makes them want to keep reading to find out what's going on. When faced with alternatives, such as the choice between active and passive voice, carefully weigh your options and choose the most effective style. During this edit, also make sure your language is fresh and original, that you haven't relied on cliches. When printing presses were used in France, the cast iron plate that reproduced the words and images was called a stereotype. The plate made a noise that sounded like cliche to French printers, so this onomatopoeic word became printer's jargon for the stereotype. Thus, cliche came to mean a saying 
idea or element of artistic work that's repeated so often it loses its original meaning. Examples are time heals all wounds, vanish into the enemy, the diamond in the rock, the calm before the storm. In 1961, when Joseph Heller first coined the expression, that's some catch 22, it was original and interesting. Now it's considered a cliche. Researchers in Spain found that common figures of speech like those had become so familiar that they no longer evoked a sensory response in readers' brains. So to keep readers immersed in whatever you've written, forego cliches in favor of new and creative ways to evoke their senses. And as you bet it, keep in mind that cliches are not limited to expressions. Characters, plot lines, and settings can also be cliché. For example, the characters in Fifty Shades of Grey by E.L. James. Just as using passive voice isn't always bad, using cliches isn't necessarily bad. For example, you might want to use them in dialogue to reveal something about a character or for humorous effect. For example, in a parody such as Monty Python and the Holy Grail. As with so many other as aspects of self-editing, when it comes to using cliches, be discriminating. We've covered some of the most common mistakes to sweep for during the line edits, inconsistencies in presentation and verb tense, wordy, repetitive, weak, and unoriginal language, amateurish styling of dialogue, and an over-reliance on telling instead of showing, and on passive voice instead of active voice. Now let's move on to the copy edit. Copy editing is fine-tuning the details, including, fix including fixing errors in grammar, syntax, and punctuation. Sometimes line and copy editing are combined, and as I've defined them, the two stages do overlap. But whereas line editing focuses on language flow and style, copy editing emphasizes fine tuning mechanics. During the copy edit, focus on correcting spelling, capitalization, punctuation, grammar, and formatting. It's easy to become overwhelmed by all the rules. So think of those elements of style as tools in your tool belt to help you communicate your ideas more clearly to readers. Instead of taking a do this and don't do that approach, think of using the best tool or tools for the job. Uh, for example, Kurt Vonnegut advised writers not to use semicolons. But in my view, it depends on what you're writing, your audience, and whether a semicolon is the best choice. Um, let's say you have two complete sentences that contain closely related ideas, that you want the reader to experience those two sentences continuously. In that case, you could put a semicolon between the two complete sentences. And that would be one correct use of a sem semicolon. Um, another correct styling uh, would be to place a period after the first sentence. Let me, let me think of an example. Um, <laughs> public speaking makes me nervous, and I'm nervous right now, okay? You could write that as public speaking makes me nervous, period. I'm nervous right now, period. Or public speaking makes me nervous, comma, and I'm nervous right now. Notice the coordinating conjunction and preceded by the comma. Or you could write, public speaking makes me nervous, semicolon. I'm nervous right now. Your choice will, of course, depend on how you want it to sound, flow, and rhythm in context with everything else you've written. Pages 39 through 41. Wait a minute. I think I got ahead of myself here. Yes, I did. Pages 36 through 38 of the handle contain lists of some of the most common errors, such as hyphenation, comma splices, omitted commas around non-essential elements, and misplaced or dangling modifiers. You can use these lists as checklists. Uh, when you have time, read through them. Pinpoint your writing weaknesses and be on the lookout for them in self-editing. One of my favorite reference books for grammar and punctuation is Eat, Shoots, and Leaves by Lynn Truss. Take a hard look at formatting and copy editing. How you present your work plays an important role in getting people to read it. Pages 39 through 41 on your handout 
provide the general industry standards for formatting, including using page breaks, paginating, creating headers and title pages, printing hard copies, and submitting electronically. Again, you can use this uh, handout as a checklist. When you're no longer making multiple corrections on every page, then and only then are you ready for proofreading. Proofreading is taking one or more final looks at a proof, which is a manuscript after it's been printed, to make sure there are no formatting mistakes, typos, or inconsistencies. There's overlapping, there's overlap in copy editing and proofreading, but in general, copy editing looks at major errors, proofreading, minor ones. Proofreading should be done a minimum of four times, twice by you, once by someone else, and once with a reliable online grant mentor. But the more times, the better. Proofread as many times as it takes to fix errors. As long as you're finding mistakes, keep proofreading. Sweep for one common mistake at a time, such as quotation marks or two spaces instead of one after sentences, and work from a hard copy because you'll catch more mistakes that way. Also take frequent breaks to rest your eyes and your brain. Reading backwards is a good way to spot those tiny, hard to catch errors, such as quotation marks that face the wrong way. Uh, section 23.2 on your handout contains a list of things to double check and repair as needed, such as page numbers. So again, here's another checklist. Proofreading is the last stage, but it's not the last step. Once you've done as much as you can, solicit unbiased feedback. A self-edit should not be your last line of defense. Don't let fear of failure and criticism or the need for perfection keep you from asking for help. Try to consider critique your friend. It's better to get feedback before your work is published, at which point it will be too late to make changes. If you're self-publishing, there are no gatekeepers, no barriers to enter. So there's nothing stopping you from publishing your work at any time. It's tempting to rush the editing process, but skipping steps is a big mistake. Spotting errors on our own is harder than finding them in someone else, else's work. We become too familiar with the content of our work and our brains fill in the gaps without our awareness. For example, we might miss LIA spelled L-I-A-S-D instead of L-I-A-I-S-D. Novices and best-selling authors alike have traps they tend to fall into, be it unnecessary repetition or too much telling and not enough showing. We know what we meant, so we don't always clearly see what we actually wrote. However, our blunders are glaring traitors. When it comes to asking for help, hiring a freelance editor will often have the best results. If that is within your budget, then you can hire the editor to review a few chapters of your book, and then use the mistakes they catch to guide you in self-editing the remainder of it. The errors they point out should be indicative of your frequently made mistakes. At the very least, have someone knowledgeable, such as a fellow writer in a writer's club or an English professor, look over your work. Find unbiased critique partners who can give you constructive criticism. There are many critique groups in the Tulsa area. Before you submit your work to an agent or publisher or if you're self-publishing before you release your work, have beta readers give you feedback and then use their feedback to fix any remaining issues. A beta reader is usually a test market reader of an un unreleased work who gives feedback to the author from the point of view of the average reader. So it's best if your beta readers aren't close friends, family members, or other writers. But some writers ask other writers to serve as beta readers in order to gain professional feedback. Ask for help. Okay. I've given you a broad overview of self-editing, as well as tips for avoiding, recognizing, and fixing some of the most common mistakes found in each stage of the process. If you find yourself dreading it, remember that writing is revision, and revision is writing. Uh, and to quote the American writer, editor, and literary critic William Zinsser, a clear sentence is no accident. Very few sentences come out right the first time or even the third time. Remember this in moments of despair. 
And we all have those moments of despair. Take your time and enjoy making your work even better than before. I encourage you to learn as much as you, as you can about writing. The more knowledge you have, the more tools you'll have in your writer's tool belt, and the more discerning you'll be when it comes to self-editing and choices of style that enable your unique writer's voice to shine through. And that's really what self-editing is all about. Thank you very much for coming. Are we out of time? Yes, we are. Okay. Is there a short question? No. Remember, if you think of anything, feel free to message me. Okay. And I'll okay. say, have, have any of you ever seen such a handbag? Never. <laughs> I don't have one yet, but I want. Got in trouble after I wrote it because I realized I didn't have enough time to cover everything. I needed a whole weekend. Yes. So. <laughs> yes. I thought, well, at least you'll have the information. Well, Julie, I have an apology. I have, I have my introduction to Paul right now. I got caught back in the hole with a problem. I skidded it around here. You can already have well, tell us who she is. Uh, tell us who she I'm is. Sorry. Get over yes. here by the microphone. Julie microphone. This is Judy Kimmel Harbaugh, one of the best editors in Oklahoma. I mean, so she, I <laughs> she has the ability to take a rough draft, dig down, find the gold that's in it. And uh, she's just a real gem, as far as I'm concerned. Absolutely. Um, she has been the Knight Rider of the Year. She's received the Golden Circle several times of Knight Riders. Uh, she's uh, edited uh, many books. She's been published and has published songs. A woman of many talents. And uh, the Knight Riders wish to present you with a token of our appreciation. This woman. Carolyn Steele is a fabulous author and she talks. I know. <laughs> and so did this gentleman right here, Jim <laughs> So, but uh, did, did anyone leave a hand? Me. Didn't get okay, there's two. You needed one. Uh, we will, Jim, I'll try to get another one made at the. No problem. Thing. I wanted to use this as a hand. That's fine. Okay, here's the hand out. Oh, okay. Okay, thank you, everyone. We'll see you back here at 1 30. Yeah. Yes.